The Fear Problem by Dr. Patrick Lockwood, which is me. First, let's read the foreword. To John Daly and Angela Chanter, Your mentorship and friendship have impacted my mind and life in ways that I could not have foreseen. I am forever changed by knowing you, and for that I am unabashedly grateful. To my father, whose wisdom and encouragement afforded me the courage to tell the truth to help others along their journey in life. To all who are struggling, your pain is real, but you can overcome it with time, effort, and change. Chapter 1 This world of ours must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate, and be, instead, a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect, said by Dwight Eisenhower. Fear. Perhaps the most primal emotion animals experience. Most individuals experience some degree of fear about the various events occurring throughout the day. Perhaps you felt fear today when you went to work because you were concerned about a deadline or a project. Or maybe you were in a threatening situation, in traffic when someone changed lanes without looking. With all the wars and conflicts occurring at present, it's highly likely that thousands of soldiers, combatants, and civilian bystanders are experiencing strong fear at this very moment. There are hundreds of circumstances in which we all feel fear, and for good reason, I propose. Without fear and other emotions, humans and other extant animal species would not have survived. Ask yourself a question. What would be the most likely emotional driving force in many of our social, political, economic, personal, and religious practices? Maybe hope? No, I don't think so because the tone of our discourse is not typically optimistic or pleasant, but usually warier. The number of wars, jihads, disease epidemics, political conflicts, and discussions about social unrest have increased in the last 200 years. Watch any political debate in most Western countries like the United States, and you will hear candidates for positions at every level of government making speeches about how bad their opponent will be for you, your family, and your livelihood. Go to any primary, secondary, or post-secondary educational institution, and you will undoubtedly find bullying, strong academic competition, and or cliques. Ask most CEOs of major corporations, as well as small businesses, about their financial or development goals for the coming fiscal year, and I guarantee that these leaders will say something along the lines of wanting market growth or increased profits. Watch news videos of religious extremists of almost any faith, and you will hear them scream, use hate speech, act violently, and are just warn about the dangers of other people, of some apocalypse or group of people. These are all fear-driven dynamics. Just playing it by the numbers, if you read the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, i.e. the Western world's fully sanctioned Bible, of mental problems, you will find that the prevalence of anxiety-related disorders in the general population sits somewhere between 8 and 15 percent. So fear runs rampant through multiple sectors of our lives. The immensity of our fear responses can easily be seen in the ghastly political climate of the United States. If we take, for example, the 2016 U.S. presidential election campaign, it is painfully obvious that the mudslinging, name-calling, and conspiracy theories were driven by some relatively unrealistic fear that the country will be ruined if this or that candidate wins the election and some stupidly optimistic belief that one candidate or the other could fix the problems of our country. From Donald Trump being cast as a racist, bigot, nationalist, and generally belligerent narcissist to Hillary Clinton being described as a heartless, resentful globalist, who's so politically desperate that she is a shill for the banking industry and foreign interests. Both sides of the aisle worked their hardest to instill fear in the American people with the help of the news media. This past election was perhaps one of the most vitriolic in the last hundred years. 
which can only mean people were struggling with a great deal of fear about the future of the country. Looking back on it now, it seems like the depths of despair, fear, and paranoia in 2016 could not have been rivaled by anything in recent history except for attack on the U.S. that occurred on September 11, 2001, or further back, the peak of the Cold War threat of nuclear war with Russia. How about events we might all consider very positive? The invention of a vaccine by Jonas Salk revolutionized medicine. The creation of a nonprofit business focused on helping veterans reintegrate into society and heal after valiantly serving their country is very touching. The profound and socially valued experience of a couple getting married seems wonderful. Writing a book to help people learn and grow and change is an act of care and concern. Religious individuals waking up in the morning and praying for peace and resolution must be all too common an example. How about our use of modern technology like cellular phones, tablets, and social media? Imagine receiving a text or a tweet from a friend, lover, or coworker. I bet you feel an urge to respond right away because you've become accustomed to the rapid pace associated with the world's amazing technological advancements. These all seem like very positive and valuable experiences in which people engage daily. The world is rapidly changing, and for good reason. But what is it that drives all of these individuals to act or respond as they do in the aforementioned examples? Fear. We could, however, argue for hours, days, weeks, months, and years about the cultural, economic, logistical, intellectual, and other factors that likely influence anyone in the examples above. But that would not be fruitful for the purposes of getting to the bottom line as I see it. Regardless of any of the hundreds of variables that can influence people to say or do things reactively or proactively, the fundamental truth that I hope to convince you of in the following pages is that our fear, our universal primal drive to survive and succeed, is the one variable that has become a problem in not only Western and Middle Eastern cultures, but the world over. Advancements in technology, medicine, communication, and a boundless number of social rights groups the world over are great examples of how our proactive response to fear has impacted the world in a more positive direction. Our fear response has been hijacked, leaving us constantly on the alert, and we need to take back control over our emotional destiny. Premises. The hallmark of any good argument is that it has clear, easily discernible points that can be supported with facts and other compelling forms of evidence. Therefore, in the following section, I would like to outline my arguments for why I believe individuals, subcultures, and societies have allowed their unchecked fear to become an unfortunate driving force in many of their behaviors and decisions. I want to reemphasize that unchecked part of my last statement. Fear is a normal, biologically based reaction that cannot be simply eradicated with the exception of the destruction of our amygdala and associated emotional brain structures. We need fear, as noted above. The problem, however, is that for reasons to be explained in later chapters, we have all become more reactive and allowed ourselves to get hijacked by our fear. Later, I will discuss some reasons as to why we're more reactive such as the increased speed of communication and profound growth of information and interpersonal conflict. So, the first premise that I hope to prove in this book is that our fear is a necessity, but that it is slowly growing out of control in unnoticeable ways. To prove this point, I will be drawing on writings, research, and examples from many academic and media sources. On a daily basis, our fear prompts us to engage in activities and behaviors that allow us to eat, function, succeed, and survive. In the last 200 years, the conditions we live in and our means of survival, literally and socially, have changed. Because of our conditions of survival changing, I believe our relationship with fear needs to change. So, I wish to make it ultimately clear that the goal of this book and this specific premise is not to show that our biological programming is a bad thing. Quite the contrary, in fact. The hope is that some of my arguments throughout this book will actually leverage your fear to promote change in a more positive direction. The second premise that I hope to prove in this book is that our unchecked fear 
both in an individual sense and our behavior in larger groups, i.e. culture, country, or ideology, to some degree or another, has become one of the most destructive forces for us all. I intend to show proof for how unchecked fear has become a destructive force on three levels. First, I intend to offer evidence that unchecked fear has a destructive impact on the individual and from many areas of their life. Second, I hope to prove empirically that unchecked fear in any and all cultures has a destructive impact for that culture. And finally, I intend to leverage the first two levels of proof to show how various individuals and cultures' unchecked fear has had a fundamentally damaging impact on world politics, social practices, and health. For example, looking at the current geopolitical landscape, the U.S. and many other countries are engaged in military conflicts. But why? Fear. We fight for our survival. We fight to maintain our sense of safety and stability. The emotion driving these fights is fear. You don't have to look any further than news headlines to find an intense rhetoric uh, at the time between the likes of Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, who threatened the U.S. with nuclear war, and President Donald Trump, to see perhaps the most obvious example of attempting to stave off a fear response to a threat of survival. You may have even had an argument with a friend or a loved one about how Donald Trump should be handling North Korea. Moreover, you could easily say that the emotional reason for the ongoing wars in the Middle East with ISIS and their predecessors is the national and international fear reaction after the attacks here in the U.S. on September 11th, 2001. What could be more dangerous and life-threatening than a terrorist group that wishes to destroy not only a country, but more so the so-called Western way of living? This shows how fear can create consequences for everyone at pretty much every level of societal functioning. The final premise I hope to prove in this book is that although there are seemingly obvious or simple solutions to managing, diminishing, or refocusing our fear, solutions which I will offer, the challenges we face as individuals and cultures to actually choose to live life differently and check our fear are too great. We will likely not change anytime soon, or even at all, unless drastic and concerted efforts are undertaken. I'm certain this sounds cynical, and it partly is, because what I propose is that we have to make a choice to live life differently. Major changes, personally or socially, take years or even decades. Based upon my work as a therapist and consultant, I can attest to the fact that significant individual change takes a long time. Therefore, on top of the likely bleak outlook, I hope to prove that we need to learn how to be patient with ourselves, our friends and intimate others, our culture, our governments, and our world climate. As I stated, I intend to offer at the end of this work a few potential solutions for how to better check our fear. On an individual level, there are dozens of physical, mental, interpersonal, and lifestyle ideas that can be offered to help manage fear in the moment, as well as decrease the likelihood of living a more fear-based lifestyle appropriate to your given context. For instance, simple changes in exercise and the addition of a wellness-based practice like meditation can help decrease an individual's average daily experience of anxiety significantly. More drastic individual efforts, for example, therapy, medications, and major lifestyle changes may be needed if you more strongly experience anxiety on a daily basis. On a cultural level, there are fewer insights or ideas I can offer the world because sociology and politics are disciplines I'm not trained in, and I have no desire to misrepresent my capabilities, though I intend to attempt to offer sound and logical propositions for culture group fear checking. The truth, and the many cultural, social, religious, political, and other ways we group ourselves, are kind of recalcitrant. There is a great deal of rigidity among religious individuals, for example. Pick a major ideology like Christianity, and you will find that various types of Christians believe other kinds don't have it right or are therefore going to hell, arguing and fighting intensely with others about the truth. 
This is a dynamic on display in the Middle East today, where factions of Islam, for instance, Sunni versus Shia, have been warring for the past roughly 2,000 years. I propose that the rigidity and bellicose nature of cultural division is due to the fact that these groups are composed of individuals. Individuals are flawed and, ironically, afraid to change. Moreover, the level of hypocrisy in any of the aforementioned groups has yet to be addressed, probably out of fear. Hypocrisy is another factor that plays into recalcitrance of the cultural fear problem. On a global scale, I believe that solutions and discussions about how to help cultures change will play a major part in helping the world check their fear-based policies. Again, I'm not a sociologist by training, and I do not consider myself a religious or political scholar. Ergo, I have no real vested interest in changing the world, per se. My hope is to convince you to have a more mindful attitude towards your fear experiences and how you deal with moments of being hijacked by your emotions. Final Thoughts I want to conclude this introductory chapter by challenging your perspective on learning and then your perspective on living. Regardless of your age, culture, occupation, level of education, political affiliation, religious beliefs, or any other self-identifying characteristics, please try to suspend your preconceived beliefs, your biases, and your previous learning. I challenge you to read the remainder of this book with an open mind, what academics call transformative learning. There's a fundamental difference between reading something and thinking, oh, this conflicts with what I believe or how I was raised, so I'm not going to give it a chance, versus, well, what this writer is saying makes me uncomfortable and challenges my beliefs, but maybe it's a good thing, and I can learn from what I'm reading. I hope that you choose the latter way of approaching this book, which will make the next few statements I make more tolerable, I hope. Freud once wrote in Civilization and Its Discontents, and I quote, The fateful question for the human species seems to me to be whether and to what extent their cultural development will succeed in mastering the disturbance of their communal life by the human instinct of aggression and self-destruction. Freud here appears to be discussing what psychoanalysts call annihilation anxiety, which can generally be described as our instinctual fear of dying, which is present from birth. This fear pushes us to fight, i.e., a reactive defense against anxiety, or achieve, i.e., a proactive defense to prevent anxiety. One way to interpret Freud's words would be to say that people will not advance or evolve so long as we succumb to our annihilation anxiety, i.e., our instinctual fear of death. In fact, as Freud predicts, the more we succumb to our fear of dying, the more it results in destructive acts. Let's take a quick look back at recent world events. Based on the events in August of 2016, it occurs to me that Freud was right. The Western world's fear of death, attack, or loss of power can readily be seen in all the conflicts with ISIS, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China, and about 80 other powers or groups that also seem to be reacting and proactively behaving due to strong fear. In fact, an article a few years ago in The Nation found sources evidencing that the United States alone had special forces in over 133 countries, which represents an 80% increase compared to approximately five years prior. The widespread fear in international conflict is both exasperating and scary. Looking back 100 years in history, the sheer number of global, country-destroying conflicts was at least tenfold less. But why? Again, as Freud said, our cultures, despite profound advances in technology and medicine, have not truly evolved past our more primitive in instincts. I believe we have not evolved past our more primitive instincts. I believe we typically choose not to better manage our primitive instincts because our primitive instincts and emotions still can and do serve us to proactively work for a better individual and collective life. This is a point I will more thoroughly discuss in Chapter 2. So the world is at war. Has there not always been international conflict? The correct answer is, well, yes, of course. It is entirely likely that this lifestyle of fear many individuals and cultures have adapted will not change significantly 
or at least not without some major catalyst. There is another problem with the desire for big change in the world. Peace is not a possibility. From a biological, historical, and evolutionary perspective, there is no proof that humans and other animals have ever been able to be at peace consistently, nor were we or they designed for complete peace. The non-possibility of peace will also be covered in chapters 2 and 3. Ergo, if none of us are designed to be at peace, then why should we expect the world to be at peace? It seems as if Darwin's argument that survival is all we strive for and the fittest survive the longest or in the best way is appropriate here. If you believe Darwin's theory that our internal drive for survival and our drive to attain fitness for better survival over our peers leads to normal and expectable conflict as well as loving cooperation, then peace is definitely not a possibility. In fact, I believe it to be profoundly inane and infantile when any scholar, politician, philosopher, or other group of people pushes for something like world peace or sustained peace in some land. Asking humans to not be human is likely a failed strategy and a waste of words. Even though humans are the most evolved species in the mammalian group, we're still primal creatures with a need to survive and thrive. I would like to make a more philosophical note and distinction for anyone who has read thus far or listened thus far and feels concerned about what I seem to be espousing about the solution to the fear problem. This is not some kind of communist or Marxist manifesto. I do not believe we all need to reorganize society and sing kumbaya. It would be delusional to believe that the unattainably idealistic notions of any socialist conceptions and ideologies like communism or Marxism have any chance of working, as their original authors hoped for, because again, our Darwinist or fear-driven desire to succeed and thrive and survive should always promote some amount of expectable, manageable, and productive competitions towards a better life. This is a concept exemplified in the normal curve. A certain percentage of the population will struggle a significant amount by chance or by failing to thrive. Some people will be born in disadvantageous biological or social circumstances, whereas others will, by chance and or by effort, be more advantaged. Roughly 68% of us will live in the middle in terms of fitness, attractiveness, intelligence, wealth, education, and comfort taken together as an aggregate. Naturally, so, people will strive to better themselves to get towards the second and third standard deviation on the normal curve regarding any of these concepts. This has been especially obvious in the fight about the 1% in terms of wealth here in the United States. It would be positively incredulous to propose challenging others to completely deny their instincts towards becoming better than you, as a socialist ideology would ask us to do. This has no chance of succeeding for any length of time in large groups. Life in general, and more specifically, individual psychological functioning, is far too complex a concept to afford us to be able to pick one ideology as all-encompassing. For further arguments to support this point, listen to the talks given by speakers like Dr. Jordan Peterson. It is therefore the goal of this work to inform, convince, and challenge you, the reader, listener, and make clear the insidious and destructive changes that have occurred due to our unchecked fear, both individually and in various social and cultural groups. The secondary goal of this work is to help the reader, listener, find more ways to understand and manage both personal fear issues and how each individual reader contributes to the propagation or diminishment of the fear narrative and operations in their society and cultural groups. Finally, and most practicably, it is my hope that we can begin to have discussions in our homes, with our friends, at our political conventions, places of business, and everywhere else about the truth, the truth about what we as individuals and groups desire most. If any of us to, were to be completely honest about the important goals we have, then we would find that fear is at least partly responsible for them. The problem is simple. Our healthy fear has been hijacked by our lifestyle and cultures and become the impetus for many significant problems in our lives as individuals and groups. Chapter 2. 
types of fear. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light, said Plato. A Psychological Approach to Fear Over the last 100 years or so, authors, practitioners, and researchers within psychology and related disciplines have been discussing how to conceptualize fear and anxiety. Again, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to separate out the less pertinent details of fear research and focus on the predominant paradigms. The next chapter is going to discuss the biological mechanisms that underlie what we describe as fear in our everyday discussions. For now, I'd like to differentiate between the two predominant kinds of fear reactions we experience from a psychological standpoint. Innate fear and learned fear. As you'll learn by reading on this chapter, the description of these two types of fear seems somewhat self-explanatory, but the differences are deceptively simple in terms of how one type of fear or another is problematic. Once you read on into the next chapter about the biological forces at play in our fear circuitry, it will become even more clear how obvious yet insidious our fear process works to both help us function and survive, as well as how easily it can lead us to problems discussed in chapters 4 through 7. Instinctual Fear Authors across many disciplines group fear into two categories instinctual fear and learned fear. The first type of fear, instinctual fear, is found in all humans, mammals, and most reptiles. We are all programmed to be afraid of people or experiences that can harm our ability to thrive, survive, or satisfy other basic evolutionary needs. This innate fear response comes in two varieties. First, we will all naturally have a fear response whenever we perceive our physical well-being is threatened. For example, research using different species of animals shows that they will become afraid of predator pheromones, even if the animal has never been exposed to the predator. This shows that there is an inherited schema or model in these animal brains for, oh, I sense this predator chemical. I should be afraid and act accordingly. Moreover, Research shows that humans innately scan faces and automatically feel afraid when we perceive a threatening or fearful facial expression. This kind of research and other commonly accepted scientific assertions point to an evolutionary need for an innate fear of varying levels of threatening circumstances or individuals. Other common examples of instinctually based fears are reactions to dangerous animals, insects, and bodily states, for example, choking, extreme pain, sight of blood, and so on. Second, we all have innate fear responses related to being socially disconnected from or by important others in our presence. Essentially, we all have an evolutionarily necessary uh, need to be supported by and connected to people. From the moment we are born to the moment we die, we are all seeking connection. Connection with others helps us feel safe, survive better, and develop a ready source of mirroring, i.e. empathic relating, and support for our needs. Because we need connection, from less intense connections like acquaintances or passers-by on the street, to more intense connections like the bond between lovers or parents and their children, we naturally feel afraid when we perceive that we are losing a connection, i.e. separation anxiety. Generally, the intensity of the connection with the person will dictate the intensity of the fear response when someone attempts to, or actually does, separate from us. After we are separated from, we typically feel sad or ashamed. So, to clarify, I'm only focusing here on the perception of separation from people in our lives. Generally speaking, our innate fears should not result in many problematic consequences. If you think about the last time you saw a spider while walking around your neighborhood or on a hike, you probably had a feeling of fear that encouraged you to move away from it or maybe even kill it. Theoretically, this response you had, which all of us have had, is not going to result in any negative consequences. At worst, we might trip as we run away or something like that. 
There are, however, some instances where our innate fear response might become problematic in modern day life. The simplest example is driving. Driving is a learned behavior. Our more primitive ancestors had no cars, so we have no biological schemata for driving. We do, however, have an innate fear response related to large objects coming at us, especially if said large object is out of control or unavoidable. This would be akin to the fear a monkey might feel when a rhinoceros is stampeding in its general direction. So when we drive nowadays, we are surrounded by numerous large out-of-control objects. Now and again, or almost every day if you're in Los Angeles like myself, we might experience a careless driver swerving into our lane or not paying attention and almost hitting us as we drive. When this happens, we often feel a fear or possibly a rage response and might even feel compelled to flip the bird in the direction of the car threatening us. This can be problematic because it can result in other accidents or possibly even fights on the road, i.e. road rage, which is sadly a somewhat common experience in big cities all over the world. This is an example of how a direct threat to our survival, an innate fear response, can lead to negative consequences and maladaptive behaviors. Again, I emphatically assert that our natural or gut innate response for fear is not typically problematic. Learned fear. The second kind of fear, learned fear, is born out of the process of capitalizing on or modifying our instinctual fear response. When we are exposed to situations, persons, places, or things that directly or are related to an experience that elicits our innate fear response, we then learn via direct activation of the same innate fear brain pathways to fear that once neutral situation, person, place, or thing. Researchers in psychology typically call this process fear conditioning or fear learning. The first and perhaps most well-known example of learned fear comes from John Watson's torturing a baby named little Albert by teaching him to be afraid of seemingly cute animals. Feel free to check out the videos on YouTube. No person is inherently, i.e. from birth, afraid of a cute looking white rabbit, but little Albert was. After Watson finished teaching him to associate a loud, scary, unexpected noise with seeing a white rabbit. So let's use this little Albert example of learned fear in the context of gun violence. This will probably cause some of you to get a little upset, so try to bear with me. I'm not advocating for gun control or a gun free-for-all, so calm down. This is purely an academic thought experiment regarding how learned fear occurs in humans and most animals. So, for example, take any six-month-old infant and place them in a room with nothing in it except, say, one toy the infant has never seen or played with before, and a handgun, let's say an unloaded Glock 9mm for the sake of this example. I guarantee you that the majority of infants around this age will readily explore both the toy and the handgun with both equal reservation and curiosity. But why? Because infants know only to fear persons, places, things, or situations that trigger their instinctual fear at about this age. I.e., is this unsafe or safe? Let's say, theoretically, you load the gun and fire off the handgun unexpectedly in front of, not at, the infant. After only one unexpected firing, I can also guarantee you that the infant will cry, have hearing problems, be afraid of the gun, and it will probably avoid handguns in the future if put in the same theoretical room. You would also probably end up in jail for child endangerment or something of that nature, so don't do that. But why would the infant become essentially permanently afraid of handguns? Again, we are biologically predisposed to be afraid of loud and unexpected noises, just like in the case of little Albert. So what happened was the once neutral handgun the infant was first exposed to was at first interesting, sitting in the same room with the toy. The gun then became scary after it was unexpectedly fired because the loud noise elicited the infant's natural shock and fear response. 
This example can be generalized to most phenomenon we are afraid of nowadays in the civilized world. Fear of people who look seemingly like a stereotypical terrorist from the Middle East is another good example. You show a dark-skinned, bearded man in a turban holding an ISIS flag to a baby, and the baby will smile and try to get his attention until the man responds to the baby's attempts at receiving attention by either smiling or scowling. An adult from the U.S., however, would likely feel some fear and hesitation when confronted with the same figure because of the last 15-plus years of being exposed to the media and politicians associating stereotypically Middle Eastern-looking individuals with threats to safety. Please take care in reading and listening to the next paragraph because what I'm about to say is very important and very specifically worded. Is this a realistic and reasonable fear for the adult? I would say yes because Islamic extremist groups typically reside and recruit in the Middle East and Africa, wherein cultures look a certain way. Moreover, Islamic extremists have been the more recent and destructive outside group to attack the U.S. in the recent past. Therefore, it is reasonable to have at the very least a low-level fear response to someone fitting that stereotypical Middle Eastern profile if you've constantly been told to be afraid of someone and seen bad things happen at both the hands of people fitting their description. I am not, however, asserting that we need to succumb to our fear and treat individuals of Middle Eastern culture or descent with hatred, disrespect, or intense circumspection. I believe, but can't prove empirically, that it would be very fair to say that a significant majority of stereotypically Middle Eastern-looking individuals we might meet in the U.S. are normal, law-abiding individuals with no ties to dangerous groups. Unfortunately, most people are too hijacked by their fear to take a more civil approach towards their fellow man. This example can serve in your minds as a basic template for the fear hijacking phenomenon I want to help us understand and cope with better. Summary. This has been a brief overview of the two distinct types of fear responses all humans and animals will show when presented with a perceived threat. I want to draw special attention to the use of the word perceived in the last sentence because it is actually the crux of my arguments throughout this book. We all have essentially the same basic instinctual fears, no matter where we are born, what languages we speak, or how we are raised. What may differ indeed is how we learn to be afraid of various persons, situations, objects, or ideas. We're discussing now a problem of perception. How we are taught to perceive things is the source of our hijacked fear phenomenon. There are many, many details and factors that go into how we learn to be afraid of these various phenomena, which I will undertake in later chapters more thoroughly when I discuss the social drivers of our fear hijacking process. What also may differ is how we express our fear response. Some families and cultures are more verbally expressive when it comes to coping with their feelings, whereas other families and cultures might be more behaviorally inclined to express their fear. Yet, some people might be so badly traumatized or ashamed for expressing their feelings that they might shy away from expressing them at all. Most people learn how to express their fear in various ways. For now, I simply want to reinforce that we are looking at a battle of learned fear. So let's put this all together, brain and psyche, which is discussed in the next chapter. Chapter 3. Bioevolutionary Origins of Fear If you know the enemy and know yourself... You need not fear the results of a hundred battles, said Sun Tzu. Humans are without a doubt one of the most advanced species that exists for one basic reason, frontal and neocortex volume development. Our neocortex is the outer layer of the brain responsible for intricate processing of information in the brain. The most advanced scientific achievements, like the 
Hubble telescope and cellular phone technology, as well as revolutionary moral and philosophical insights are all due to the evolution of the neocortex, our best tool. As our higher brain areas have evolved, our societies and cultures have had to continuously update rules, politics, and relational principles in accordance with the intellectual and philosophical growth afforded by such brain evolution. Certain parts of the brain, i.e. our emotional midbrain, have not evolved in the same sophisticated way. Moreover, the way we manage our less developed emotional midbrain is still relatively medieval. I propose that this disconnect between midbrain evolution compared to our technological and sociocultural advances prompted by forebrain cortex evolution sits at the foundation of our fear problem in this world. Let's consider this disconnect argument from the perspective of history. Once upon a time, about 300 years ago, we effectively had no medicine, minimal technology, and limited intergroup communication and relations in most areas of the world. Ergo, humans had to struggle to survive using more primitive means like hunting, farming, basic trade, basic service procurement, and basic economics. Living in a more primitive or survival-oriented world meant that our more re reactive fear drive was quite useful. Essentially, because we had minimal technology in very small numbers with which to fight and survive, fear was a ubiquitous catalyst for both our cultural and personal stability. We needed to live a more reactionary lifestyle due to the great uncertainty of physical health issues, i.e. disease acquisition and management, and limited intergroup connectivity. It stands to reason that if you don't know whether some new group of land inhabitants is peaceful or whether this group carries life-threatening disease, being on the defensive, i.e. fearful speculation slash proactive fearful aggression, makes sense. Somewhat unknowingly, this struggle for stability and general defensiveness also meant the advancement of the predominant individual cultural group with minimal dividends, if not major detriments, for the losers. I would propose that this process of dominant culture success is partly responsible for many of the isms and prejudices seen nowadays. I propose that we take the above-mentioned example and compare it to the status of our medical, technological, intellectual, and social capacity today. In the realm of medicine, we have the knowledge and means to cure and eradicate bacterial infections that would have destroyed our entire civilization 300 years ago. We have technology and medicine that can prevent or at least ameliorate the symptoms of most known diseases now. As a result, for instance, according to the World Health Organization, the average life expectancy the world over has increased by five years between 2000 and 2015, due to our advances in preventative medicine and sanitation practices. Intellectually speaking, there have been amazing discoveries regarding our understanding of more complex phenomena, starting with Newton's work on physics in the late 17th century up through the sequencing of the human genome in the late 20th century. We also have a more advanced understanding of simpler phenomena like how plants grow, which has contributed manifestly to our ability to farm and develop agricultural businesses. Socially, we can connect with anyone, anywhere in the world, thanks to cellular technology and internet. This almost instantaneous access to a person not in our immediate presence has drastically changed our expectations in many parts of the world about how quickly and in what manner we communicate and relate to each other which I will discuss later as a potential mitigating factor for the problem of fear. Also, the greater connectivity we have between and within societies has advanced our social and moral reasoning process. 300 years ago, Western countries would have traded African natives as slaves or dictatorially usurped power in other countries around the world for both economic and, let's say, socially immoral reasons. Whereas now most people hope, we have respect for 
and a better understanding of other cultures and countries. Most so-called civilized countries now respect the sovereignty, dignity, and worth of African cultures. We understand they are not lesser or inferior groups that deserve or need to be enslaved for their betterment and financial gain, despite these African cultures' differences in lifestyle compared to what you see in Western countries. Power usurping, well, that's an ongoing phenomenon. It just looks more diplomatic in some cases. Thanks to evolution, we have achieved great advances in our moral, social, intellectual, and medical capacity due to our advanced neocortical development. So, why are we still operating like cavemen when it comes to world politics and many daily interpersonal exchanges? I propose that this brain evolution disconnect described above is to blame. Even though we can understand and critically think through millions of social and interpersonal situations, we do not choose to do so on a regular basis. Most people typically just react and do as opposed to stopping and thinking through a situation fully. Something about how our emotional midbrain is wired or not into our higher up reasoning and planning parts of the brain is keeping us stuck in caveman mode when it comes to phenomenon like affairs, greed, hatred, bigotry, and religiously motivated violence, which are only a handful of the millions of examples of this problem. Even though humans had almost identical brain structures and proportions of white and gray matter 300 years ago, with a slight increase in white matter over the last 100 years, humans have advanced intellectually, technologically, and culturally so much so that this primitive fear-based way of being is now counterproductive. It would be facile to assert that because poverty is a problem and ISIS is attacking cultures around the world, that we need to continue to get hijacked by our evolutionarily adaptive fear response in situations like not getting a text message from someone when you want to talk with them. I believe, however, that in most first world countries, there is no need for a defensive fear-based orientation to everyday life and even major problems like terrorism. Before diving into the biological bases of fear, it is important to note that there are multiple competing theories about and definitions of concepts like stress, fear, and anxiety. I've already differentiated the types of psychologically distinct fear responses and processes in the prior chapter, instinctual versus learned fear. This bioevolutionary approach is somewhat more complicated. For instance, fear is generally regarded as both a cognitive, i.e. negative or worrisome thought, and an affective, i.e. biological behavioral process. Anxiety, however, can more simply be considered a brain-body condition of cortisol or adrenaline flow triggered by an outside stimulus. Well-respected authors like Yuck Pongsep have researched and discussed the various anxiety, panic, and fear brain systems at length. In fact, if you're so inclined, I highly recommend Pongsep and Biven's book, Archaeology of the Mind, the Neuroevolutionary Origins of Human Emotions. As a formal note to all readers, scholars, and laypersons alike, I am intentionally lumping fear and anxiety into the same concept for two reasons. First, many of the same brain areas, neurotransmitters, and hormones are involved in an overlapping manner for the various forms of semantically differentiated fear. Second, my goal is not to rewrite an emotion evolution brain textbook because others have and can do it better than I. To sift through and explain the various forms of fear or anxiety definitions and research bases would be tedious and unproductive for our purposes. Theoretically, at the very least, a low-level form of stress or anxiety about something we experience or believe will evolve into either a panic or pervasive fear issue if left to fester. 
I propose that regardless of whether we label the subjective experience as fear or anxiety, very similar and related reactive and proactive behaviors emerge. Therefore, I define fear as a biologically based, i.e. brain, body, and neurochemical hormone feeling that is accompanied by typically negative or worrisome thoughts. My goal at the end of the day is to give you an accurate and sufficiently detailed picture of the brain, body, mind experience of fear so you can understand what's happening to you when you haven't had 500,000 people like your Instagram post. Why we have fear. Then identify and manage it better than our 18th century counterparts did. The cognitive affective experience of fear is the driving force in the examples of both positive and pathological behaviors I outlined in the first chapter. I propose, therefore, that our broadly defined experience of unchecked fear, considered as either strong anxiety or the more cognitive affective fear, is a major source of many individual, cultural, and global issues prevalent in today's world. Now, I think it's important to explore how our behavioral expression of fear that will be the focus of my consequences section later in the book, as well as how fear is being driven by common phenomenon in chapter four. Behavioral manifestations of fear. Until this point, when discussing fear, I've kept the focus on more obvious or reactionary versions of fear. There are, however, more subtle and long-term behavioral manifestations of fear. For instance, in the introductory chapter, I describe some behaviors as proactive-aggressive, manifestations of our fear response. The prototypical behavioral model in psychology for behaviorally managing fear is the so-called fight-or-flight response, originally conceptualized in the 30s and refined by modern psychologists to include freezing behaviors and three other categories. This fight or flight phenomenon is considered our adaptive or innate or hardwired set of strategies informed by neurochemistry and cortisol for dealing with perceived threats. This generally makes sense because threats, depending upon how their seriousness and proximity is, let's say, showing up, will demand different strategies. Some things we simply need to escape. So we engage in flight behaviors. Some circumstances are, unfortunately, not truly amenable to an escape strategy, so we must fight to de-escalate the threat. Regarding freeze behaviors in the face of perceived threats, that might seem counterintuitive. The truth is, in the animal kingdom, some predators will lose interest in prey if they appear to be dead. The challenge is no longer there, and the meat might be spoiled. Moving forward, we will focus on brain processes involved in fear, but rest assured, we will double back to this introductory discussion of the behavioral manifestations of fear. Fear in the brain. When it comes to explaining our fear experience, there are many useful paradigms in the psychology, evolutionary biology, and neuroscience literature. Given that this is a more applied book, not a graduate school textbook on neuroscience or psychology, I will attempt to give a simple overview of the basic biological and psychological components of fear in humans. The hope here, in addition to educating you on the why and how of the basic fear processes you experience daily, is to provide you with a sense of agency in managing your affective states like fear. Knowledge is power. And I dare say we have felt powerless to our negative emotional states for millennia, which has resulted in much unnecessary suffering for millions of people. Neurological and Chemical Bases of Fear If you think back to the introductory chapter I mentioned, an example of how we can destroy certain parts of the brain and essentially operate without fear. Although this statement is an oversimplification of a complex instinctual neurobehavioral process, the truth is fear is expressed and modulated by a relatively small number of chemicals and brain areas. 
of the prevailing theories on fear, the most recent and comprehensive review comes from the work of Kint in Amsterdam. The predominant brain areas involved in our fear response include those responsible for sensation and perception, such as the insular cortex, thalamus, and parts of the brainstem, and memory, such as the hippocampus and amygdala, and emotion motivation and management, such as the amygdala, periaqueductal gray, and ventromedial hypothalamus. This makes sense because if you think of any situation wherein we experience fear, we usually need to perceive the threatening stimulus and situation, which causes the fear reaction. Then, remember the things quickly that help us determine how to act, and then have motivation or emotion to survive and or cope with the threat. Of these brain areas related to the perception and mediation of our fear response, the one most authors discuss at length is the amygdala. It is responsible for fear memory and is particularly involved in our perception of seemingly threatening stimuli, even to the point where it can differentiate fearful facial expressions. The predominant chemicals involved in our fear response are norepinephrine, cholecystokinin, and cortisol. Norepinephrine and cholecystokinin are produced in the brain, and cortisol is produced by the adrenal glands on top of your kidneys. Cortisol, however, is secreted in response to perceived stressors, and it not only prepares your body to deal with anxiety, but it also enters the brain and modifies activity in the anxiety and memory production areas of the brain mentioned above. Another great book on cortisol and fear and stress is Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, which nicely details the destructive nature of excessive and or prolonged exposure of humans to cortisol our primary stress and fear hormone. Essentially, all the chemicals work together in a symphony of activity throughout the brain and body to ready our senses, primal thinking, and bodily states to either run away or stay and fight. Moreover, our brain is designed in such a way that when we experience even mild stress, i.e. cortisol, that we can even have more neutral stimuli activate a fight-or-flight response. On the flip side of the equation, the areas of the brain responsible for managing fear are the medial prefrontal cortex and parts of the anterior cingulate cortex. The predominant chemical in the brain responsible for anxiety amelioration is gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. This GABA compound is the chill-out chemical because it literally acts to slow down the activity of any neuron it attaches to in the brain. GABA is your braking system. GABA is the main brain chemical system activated by anti-anxiety drugs like benzodiazepines and addictive substances like marijuana and alcohol. Therefore, for the sake of oversimplification, our frontal areas of the brain are responsible for tracking and dampening our midbrain sensory and emotional areas. Relating back to that example in the first chapter, where part of the brain was destroyed that essentially eliminated fear in monkeys, the authors destroyed the amygdala, right? Unfortunately, loss of fear and fear learning is not the only consequence of destroying the amygdala, so that's not a responsible approach to ameliorating fear or the fear problem. If we destroyed the part of the brain responsible for instinctual fear, i.e. necessary fear, then we would be putting ourselves in danger when we find ourselves in realistically threatening situations like fights, healthy competition, and other reasonable threats to our well-being. Now, this is an oversimplification of the fear process in terms of memory, behavioral expression, and visceral responses to threats, but the experimental research shows that we can essentially live without a strong conscious response to threats. How fear happens. There is no simple way of separating out the psychological and chemical reactions based upon where these chemicals are active in the brain. So, I will try to describe the process of being afraid from a neurochemical perspective using a relatable and relatively neutral example. Think of yourself 
Walking alone down on a side street or an alley in a big city like New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles late at night, around roughly 1 a.m. As you walk, you hear footsteps behind you that appear to be getting closer. You glance backwards and notice that there is a shadowy figure in a hooded sweatshirt following you, but you can't really discern who the person is, what the person looks like, or what they seem to be doing. You speed up your pace to try and determine whether the person walking uncomfortably close behind you will speed up as well, or is following you. You notice that the person keeps up with your pace. You begin to walk even faster and head towards a well-lit area near a busy gas station. The person's footsteps continue to match your own pace and get closer and closer to you as you near the busy gas station. Finally you dash across the street to the gas station. When you turn around, you see that the person behind you is gone, nowhere in sight. So, what happened in your brain and body? Well, the specifics would depend upon any previous experiences you've had walking alone at night in a big city. However, for our purposes, just assume you're a typical non-traumatized or non-assault victim. Let's break this example down into a series of four scenes outlining behaviors, context, and brain activity. Scene one, walking alone at night in an alley in a big city. The behavior is walking. The context is you're alone late at night in an alley in a big city that's known for assaults. The brain, your sensation and perception areas sense that you're alone, and that it's night. The frontal areas of your brain process the context and any previous learning about the dangers of walking alone at night. Your emotional and motivational areas, in concert with your memory areas, start sending signals to the frontal and motor parts of the brain to be alert and signal your adrenal glands on your kidneys to release a small dose of cortisol to prepare you. Scene 2 hearing footsteps behind you while walking alone. Behavior. Hearing footsteps behind you and speeding up your pace. Context. Alone. Late at night, in an alley, in a big city known for assault. Brain. Your sensation and perception areas, they hear the footsteps and feel your body tense up without thinking. They begin communicating with your frontal area. Your memory areas begin to recall real, i.e. personal experiences and news reports, and fictional, i.e. movies and shows, examples of people hurt or mugged while walking alone at night. Your frontal areas process the potential meanings of footsteps and any previous learning about the dangers of walking alone at night. The emotional and motivational areas start sending signals to the frontal parts of the brain to increase your level of alertness, begin to release norepinephrine to motivational areas of the brain for readiness, and signal your adrenal glands on your kidneys to release a larger dose of cortisol to prepare you. Scene 3. Footsteps speed up behind you, then seeing the gas station. The behavior. Hearing footsteps behind you speeding up and seeing the gas station. Context. Alone late at night, in an alley, in a big city, known for assaults, beginning to see a safe area, seemingly increasing threat. Brain. The sensation perception areas of your brain hear the footsteps speeding up, feeling your body tense up as a reaction to the perceived threat, seeing the gas station, communicating with the frontal and emotion motivational areas. The memory areas, increased speed of recall, of all those experiences discussed prior, examples of people getting hurt while walking alone at night, recalling reasonable strategies for dealing with perceived threat after seeing the gas station. The frontal areas, they process the potential meaning of the increased speed of the footsteps, developing a plan to avoid perceived threat, incorporating use of gas stations into the plan for avoiding the perceived threat. Emotional and motivational areas, Increase the rate of sending signals to the frontal parts of the brain to increase your levels of alertness. Increased rate of release of norepinephrine to motivational areas of the brain for readiness. 
increase strength of signal to your adrenal glands on your kidneys to release an even larger dose of cortisol to help you have energy to escape. Scene four, you dash across the street, reach the gas station, turn around to find no one. So the behavior is you run across the street, you turn around, and you look for the threat. The context, well-lit area around people late at night in a big city known for assaults but seemingly safe. Brain, the sensation and perception areas. They feel your body tense up and heart rate increase as you dash across the street. Seeing no one behind you decreases sensory alertness, increases communication to frontal areas of the brain. The memory areas decrease the speed of recall of real and fictional examples of people getting hurt or mugged while walking alone at night. Recalling reasonable strategies for dealing with perceived threat after seeing the gas station due to the frontal area input. The frontal areas process the level of threat resulting in a belief about being safe because you're around others in a well-lit area as well as not being able to see anyone nearby who could have been following you. This sends signals to memory and motivational areas to decrease alertness. The emotional and motivational areas decrease the rate of sending signals to frontal parts of the brain, and they decrease the, rela- the rate of release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, to motivational areas of your brain for readiness. They decrease the strength of the signal to your adrenal glands on your kidneys to slow the release of cortisol, which helped you have energy to get to the gas station. After approximately 5 to 10 minutes or so, all the hormone and neurochemical activity goes back to baseline, approximately. So that was a very brief and minimalistic explanation of how your brain, mind, and body all work together to evaluate, react, and act in a seemingly threatening situation. I want you all to notice a few things about the breakdown of the theoretical example. First, all four scenes... No one scene can operate in isolation. All the reactions and brain processing, these things occur in an overlapping sequence, and the context is always key. The brain and the body would react very differently if you turn around as soon as you heard the footsteps and saw a little old man or a little old nun. Second, no one brain area worked in isolation. Although some areas of the brain can act more independently, like your motivation areas automatically sending signals without your conscious permission, rarely is one part of the brain acting alone to cause changes in behavior. The brain areas discussed in the examination of this theoretical example were constantly communicating back and forth with each other, which is actually true regardless of threat. All of our brain areas are always communicating with each other all the time. Finally, notice that it's not just your brain automatically reacting to a threatening situation. Like almost every experience we have, there are contextual issues, hormones, emotions, biases, and expectations that affect how we act and react. This symphony of chemicals Hormones and brain processing is essentially no different across the various kinds of threats we commonly experience. Seeing a lion running toward you is going to elicit this fear response. Even the most menial threats, like not getting a text message back from someone you know, or feeling threatened by a younger, more attractive, more accomplished person in a social situation, initiate this fear response. What varies considerably among the brain, mind, body experiences during fearful situations are the length of time cortisol is flowing and the amount of emotional overwhelm that occurs to the point that our frontal cortex cannot process or manage our emotions. More intense or potentially extreme threats will more strongly overwhelm our frontal cortex ability to manage what we're experiencing, which can be useful or not depending upon whether we need to fight and be more primal. Research has shown that a significant amount of fear, i.e. mediated by amygdala, cortisol, norepinephrine, can significantly cut off communication to our frontal lobe. If we're particularly hijacked, it is biologically impossible to think through things. Summary. 
So, from the biological and psychological point of view, we have highly developed frontal brain areas and reasoning capabilities that mediate or modulate our more emotional midbrain areas. Our frontal areas, communicating with our memory areas, account for the context of our situation, previous learning and information, and current skills and beliefs when trying to deal with something that we experience that causes a strong emotional reaction. Many of our emotional experience cause automatic body and brain reactions, i.e. the stress hormone cortisol to release, that prompt us to react and behave in a more primitive manner. It is this battle, I assert, between our automatic emotional reactivity and our frontal reasoning skills that is being lost daily. We have learned, i.e. learned fear, to treat many non-life-threatening experiences, such as social media bullying, political rhetoric, or even liking different sports teams, as life-threatening, eliciting our strong fear response. Here's one final example, and it will be emotionally challenging, so please bear with me. I believe we have this strong fear-based delusion in the U.S. wherein many individuals media groups, and other politicians consider their opponents or opposite party individuals to be as threatening as a potential terrorist attack. How many times in a given day do you hear someone say that presidential candidate X is going to destroy the country or that their opponent is a horrible person? In the 2016 U.S. presidential election, people compare conservative presidential candidates to Hitler and liberal candidates to Stalin. Really? They're that destructive? Give me a break. Politicians and their policies in the U.S. can be harmful, but not like the Holocaust. The fact of the matter is neither candidate will likely cause the country to collapse. They might make their citizens' way of life more challenging, with a bad tax plan or some other policy. People could lose jobs or become marginalized. However, this is not the same as life-threatening in most cases. It would be tragic if your cultural group remained or became marginalized, and we should definitely do something to help those people who are suffering. Many of the laws already in place in most countries like the U.S. would be very difficult to repeal or dismantle to the point where people's civil rights disappear and millions die in one term of a presidency. No first world country is perfect or treating all of its citizens well, but we have evolved too much for fully functioning societies to just collapse into the World War II era Machiavellian political change that caused the Holocaust. Also, as a reaction to our fear about leaders hurting us, we have developed this odd delusion of omnipotence about presidents. Presidents cannot wave a magic wand and end racism or solve economic issues, if only they could. This is a point I will discuss further in Chapter 4 when I fully discuss the implications of unchecked fear on culture and society. To be clear, I am not advocating to just sit back and say nothing about your political beliefs or your worries about social issues. The real question I'm posing to you is this. Do you need to get that hijacked about politics? Do you need to have that strong of a fear response about something that's out of your control? Chapter 4 Social Factors and Unchecked Fear Religion is an illusion, and it derives its strength from the fact that it falls in with our instinctual desires, said by Sigmund Freud. As you learn in the last chapter, our fear response is driven by brain mechanisms that can be triggered by either innately scary phenomenon or situations, persons, places, or things that we have learned to fear. I've been proposing that our learned fears have gotten out of control. 
but have yet to discuss what specifically might be contributing to our fear problem. It is no secret that the world is riddled with social and technological phenomena that contribute to what I propose to be our unchecked fear problem. You could go to any country in the world and handpick just one big umbrella phenomenon and spend years debating how it impacts the people in that region and that region's culture and its world politics. To keep this book from becoming hundreds of pages in length, I have decided to choose four of what I consider to be the most impactful phenomena in our fear-driven societies. There are entire books devoted to each of these topics, so this will be a more cursory or superficial analysis. I hope, however, that my analysis is fair and accurate. The goal of this chapter is twofold. First, I want to challenge you in a fair and intellectually honest manner to examine your relationship to these four phenomena and how you're involved in or swayed by the hijacking nature of these situations. Second, I want to provide a more psychologically nuanced viewpoint from which we can all understand why we react and then proceed forward in handling issues related to or arising from these four phenomena. Once you discover these four phenomena I've chosen, you might become wary of my motives, so please do your best to judge my arguments and conclusions for their own merit. As a reminder, this is not some intellectualized, atheistic, or communistic attack on any of your deeply held beliefs. The goal for this section of the book is simply to try and objectively showcase the consequences of our fearful adherence to these four phenomena. These four phenomena that I believe contribute manifestly to our unchecked fear problem across most parts of the world are as follows. Technology, politics, religion, and greed. One final caveat. As a scholar, I try to own up to what I know and don't know, or at least know with some degree of certainty. Many of the arguments I will make are more subjective in nature, but are supported by what I believe to be common sense and facts that you can double-check should you doubt what I propose. I know that my Western socialization and living in the United States is going to bias how I make arguments. I also wish to say that I'm not a sociologist, political expert, religious scholar, or economist, and I'm not claiming any special expertise in any of these disciplines. I graciously submit all of my arguments discussed below to anyone of expertise or experience beyond my own, which I imagine to be many people, and would appreciate any and all feedback. My hope is to simply begin illuminating important components of the global and social problem of unchecked fear. These four phenomena are salient issues across the world and seem like the best avenues to wander down because of their widespread impact on almost every group of people now. Technology. When discussing technology, there are two very prominent developments that I propose contribute to our unchecked fear problem, social media and internet-ready smartphones. The internet has been around for about 30 years or so, and smartphones for roughly 20 years. For example, the first major social media site, MySpace, was created in 2003. These are historically very young phenomena, but they have become astoundingly prominent components of everyday life. It is fair to say that these technological advancements are not innately bad or harmful. Thinking back to the gun argument in the last chapter, I assert, however, that our relationship to these amazing technological developments has become hijacked by our evolutionary necessary response of fear. The way we use this technology showcases what appears to be our now almost desperate 
need for connection and validation, even though social media and internet technology paradoxically allow us to get validation so easily and quickly. For better and for worse, these technological developments have become the vehicles for an almost instantaneous social feedback process, which have in turn modified our expectations about privacy and intimacy. Let's use cyberbullying as an example of how technology can contribute to our fear hijacking problem. For the last 10 years or so, there have been dozens of stories about cyberbullying and its tragic consequences when it's taken to the extreme. The most common examples of cyberbullying seem to be direct verbal harassment on social media or via text messages or more notably, bans of people creating social media campaigns against other kids at school or work to demean them because they're ugly, gay, or not in the in-group. I doubt this is what Mark Zuckerberg intended to happen when he created Facebook. But why are millions of kids and adults engaging in cyberbullying on every kind of social media platform? Well, I say fear. Fear of not being in the in-group. Fear of being perceived as unpopular. Fear of not being accepted. If we associate with someone who is unpopular, unattractive, or part of a dangerous minority, then we're automatically in the out-group. Heaven forbid we simply judge people by the entirety of their character or personhood. But still... This is a common, statistically speaking, occurrence. There is a sad yet understandable reason as to why many people on social media engage in reactionary attacking and ostracizing of their peers. The outgroup is dangerous to our way of being. This is defensive, fear-based responding. When we feel left out or ostracized, we have a natural, strong, negative emotional reaction because it means our genes might not survive. When we feel included and validated, we are happy and we feel safe. I would say, however, that our reasonable need to have peer validation has become hijacked by the expectations we have created about how to participate in and manage the rapid pace of modern technology like social media. Imagine if it were 40 years ago. We would have to take a photograph with a film camera, wait to have it processed, then either show it to the people that we took it of in person, print it in a magazine, or mail it out to people. It would take at least a week for people to see what we're up to using pictures and then judge our appearance. Now... It's considered weird if we do not immediately receive likes, comments, and reposts of our social media pictures. Moreover, to not participate in social media, or if you're not trying to showcase how your lifestyle is great or commensurate with some standards of some in-group, then you're also considered weird. Obviously, without social media and rapid communication technology like smartphones and tablets, we would not be able to really engage in cyberbullying. Platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat were created with the intention of maintaining connection with people and showcasing current events in our lives. These are healthy intentions because we all need to be seen and stay connected to be healthy and stay grounded. However, as platforms like these became more profitable and more widely utilized, Various industrialized cultures and subcultures, such as business, fashion, music, performance, etc., began exploiting these platforms. Nowadays, across many industries all over the globe, you must have a large social media following to be considered legitimate in your respective field. Moreover, in industrialized cultures that are more focused on bodily image, beyond what our evolutionary programming dictates for finding mates. These cultures push for being hotter or more renowned than your friends. For example, if you search for the most liked photo on Instagram, it will most assuredly be 
of someone famous and very attractive. How many provocative at-the-gym pictures, fancy meal pictures, and notable event pictures do you see every day on your social media? So, let's look at this desire to be attractive and liked on social media a little bit more closely. Is it reasonable for everyone on social media to, to be perceived as hot or have the most fun and luxurious lifestyle? No, not at all. Most individuals live a more mundane life and are of average attractiveness, unlike celebrities and extremely wealthy individuals. We have, therefore, become obsessed with living a life that's unreasonable or unattainable. When we fail to live up to these unreasonable standards, we feel ostracized. And when we feel ostracized, this exacerbates our extant self-esteem issues, which I will discuss in detail in the next chapter. A common question my fellow psychologists raise is, what reasonable influence should social media have on the average person? That's hard to say. If our evolutionary programming promotes staying connected and being liked, then it would make sense to engage in some degree of social media participation. As society and technology evolve, so does our blueprint for connectivity and validation. Therefore, I propose that feeling an urge to participate in social media is normal. But how strong should the urge to participate be? Well, it's hard to say, because again, social media has become a statistically normal way of communicating and receiving validation. I personally hope you all could be having a more detached relationship with your phone and your social media. However, it seems as if most people of all ages are now obsessed. Literally obsessed, as you might see it defined in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Handbook for Doctors and Therapists. If you took a straw poll of social media users, I would wager that many are at least slightly concerned about how many likes their photograph will garner or how many people see their post. Many people, I know, feel very strongly compelled to post attractive pictures or spend their latest dinner party as something so fun. If we consider this obsession, this hijacking of our normal desire to be seen and liked, from the perspective of the amount of time spent on social media, many studies average out to something like over four hours per day in industrialized nations. That's four hours of superficial connection and staring at a screen, as opposed to face-to-face -face interaction where we truly feel connected, seen, and emotionally satisfied. Four hours of validation seeking online. Moreover, a recent survey showed that 78% of people in the U.S. had at least one social media profile. So social media is that big, 78% four hours a day. In a world with constant connection due to population increases and rapid communication technology allowing for instant validation, do we really need to worry all that much about who is posting what and whether people liked your post? No. It is my belief that our natural need for connection, assisted by rapid communication technology and social media, has been hijacked by various cultures and subcultures. Our cultures have taken two amazing gifts and made them unnecessarily competitive and important means of gaining social validation, which has resulted in a general attitude of fear-based relations online and in person. Remember, social media usage is widespread, ever-growing, and very lucrative as a phenomenon. As we've come to spend more time and rely on these technological gifts, we've also given them more power over our emotional reactivity by assimilating them into our schema and schedule of imperative or normal ways of relating. Based upon my experiences and relationships with people participating on social media in both large and small cities in the U.S., 
I can safely say that many people have significant levels of a fear response about their posts and pictures, a worry about how people will receive them. Is that necessary? If your picture on Instagram gets 20 likes, will you be irreparably ostracized? Not at all. But that's exactly the worry that results in widespread fear-driven relationships to our technology. We need to let go of our perceived need for constant positive validation. And this falsely exaggerated importance of technology. This proposed move towards less social media reliance may not be good for technology and media companies' bottom lines, but it would be a good first step towards decreasing the incidence of problems like cyberbullying and low self-esteem that contributes to our unchecked fear problem. We cannot change our expectations about how to relate to technology until we check our emotions. Try telling an Iraq war veteran their PTSD-induced flashbacks aren't really happening. You think they'll automatically calm down? Nope. We must manage the feelings first, which I will discuss at length in Chapter 8. Politics. One of the oldest social institutions in existence is politics. Although this is not a historical text, it is important to know when and where our problems started. Many academics consider ancient Greek democracy and ancient Roman Republican politics to be the foundational forces for political thought in the industrialized world. Even before the ancient Greek and Roman systems of political discourse in the 8th century BC, there were likely many, many, many more informal systems of governance in African tribal societies, Middle Eastern societies, Southeast Asian societies, and native cultures. Hopefully, anthropologists and other social scientists will discover artifacts that explain the organizations of these above-mentioned cultures so that we can kind of defeat our Western notion of how things have been. Regardless of the theoretical influences of non-European cultures, the fact remains that informal political dealings have been a constant force since the beginning of organized civilizations. Every time one group of people has had power in a region, there have been multiple outgroups competing for that same power. If we fast forward to 2017, political issues are some of the most incendiary and incessant topics discussed in countries all over the world. I am a citizen of the United States, and we are in the midst of electing our president as I am writing this text in 2016. I have had the displeasure of hearing from friends, family, news pundits, and colleagues alike absolutely disparaging and disheartening discourse about how the U.S. will collapse if their candidate does not win. The intensity of the rhetoric and conjecture, with some facts sprinkled on top every once in a while, feels so much more extreme than any other election I have seen. The vitriol of the 2016 U.S. election is worse than past elections. I have heard about from those who are older and much wiser than myself. For the purposes of keeping this brief, I will again focus more on the 2016 U.S. presidential election as an example rather than those in other countries because there are voluminous examples of politics causing social and physical harm to people readily available to you. Check out YouTube, and you will find plenty of videos of politicians in many countries assaulting each other in their houses of parliament and the like. The standard question I ask in this chapter, and hope to answer effectively, is why a given phenomenon is such a problem. One factor I believe plays a role in the hijacking of our fear response when it comes to politics is news media. I simply cannot focus on the issues developing out of news media here because they deserve a full discussion in a separate book. Moreover, I believe that news media in the U.S. is such an insurmountable obstacle to emotional freedom. There are simply too many confounding and intractable variables in the news media problem, like money and power. To simply illustrate the problem, 
I've included the following brief example of how the media contributes to political problems in the U.S. If you do a quick search for news media discussions of how nasty or uncivilized the current presidential election has been, you will see numerous videos and stories by pundits and journalists describing how critical or vicious certain news stations or pundits have been in their discussion of a particular candidate. It is noble that the media is pointing out how crude the discourse has become. The problem is, no one has stopped saying or propagating base or nasty speech. The media continues to hypocritically critique competing programs and pundits without cleaning up their own act. Most major news organizations continue to run stories not based on facts, which are inflammatory and biasing. Making inflammatory statements is a great way to maintain viewership, promote a particular ideology, and stir up the masses. So I'd like to move on to a more reasonable and resolvable issue in the U.S. political process and discourse. There are two topics in this subsection, bipartisan relations and our culture of progress. Bipartisan relations. I believe that the most prominent example of how politics plays a role in the hijacking of our fear response is the inherently bipartite nature of the U.S. political system. Yes, there are the ever-popular independent, libertarian, and green parties, but our presidents almost always come from the big two, Democrats and Republicans. It is true that George Washington, John Tyler, and Andrew Johnson were from non-major parties, when they were elected president of the United States. The fact remains that though modern U.S. politics has always been divided along the two-party, or as I think it would be better described, two-philosophy system, inherently it would not necessarily be problematic to have a two-party system. The problem with the two-party system of political and social discourse is that the issues faced by the U.S. culture are not simply remedied by having a totally conservative or liberal mindset. Statistically speaking, if you look at polling data and voting record data, we can predict someone's beliefs about gun control based upon their beliefs about gay marriage. Conservatives typically vote one way on both issues, and liberals typically vote in the inverse manner. I would assert, however, that the two issues are drastically different in terms of both their logistics and their implications. A reasonable, rational belief about how to deal with guns is in no way similar to the issues, social, moral, religious, associated with gay marriage. A well-reasoned individual would likely borrow ideological positions from both major parties to make the healthiest and most reasonable choice for either issues. This is, again, a problem with how we have defined ourselves by our political parties and given that meaning unnecessary power over our cognitive and emotional faculties, which is beginning to find support in the neuroscience research. Think back to the cyberbullying example in the previous section. It kind of seems like we have allowed ourselves to develop a learned fear response to those people described as the outgroup, whomever does not align with your party of choice. Is the fact that you vote Democrat or Republican really a core and essential aspect of your identity? I hope not, because we are more than our job, our political identity, or our sexual orientation. I believe all people would be healthier if they could understand the beautifully challenging and complex variables, hundreds of them, that make up a person. We need an integrated and balanced self-identity. This two-philosophy political system and the way the U.S. culture has decided to integrate it into personal identity has resulted in a problem that college is called black and white thinking. When we are hijacked by our emotions, we tend to revert to more primitive ways of being and operating. When our brains were young, before the age of two, we processed information more in a black and white manner, all or nothing. We generally experience things as promoting safety or danger. As our frontal cortex grew and we began to learn social and moral reasoning, 
we learn to see the shades of gray in experience. I propose that the incessant two-party glorification in the U.S. by politicians, media, and everyday people promotes this primitive reactionary style. Republicans are associated with all sorts of bad policies, figures, and closed-mindedness. Democrats are likewise associated with morally reprehensible figures, dangerously liberal beliefs, and typically short-sighted fiscal practices. If you align with a third party, you're typically looked upon as a weirdo, akin to the people who don't participate on social media. Political party, i.e. philosophy, choice in the U.S. is an instantaneous fear hijacker. And here are some simple examples to prove the point. First, I ask, how many times have you had a heated discussion with a friend, family member, or coworker about their liking of an opposing candidate? If anyone reading or listening has never had an argument about politics, please contact me right away so I can learn your secret. The reality of the situation is if you're alive in the U.S. and you're over the age of 18, you likely have engaged in arguments about politics at least a half a dozen times during the year of the 2016 election because it's an election year. Imagine if you got rid of the two candidates in the 2016 U.S. election and tried to simply discuss the issues or problems of the country. This seems like a noble idea, right? I can guarantee you that at some point you or your opponent will blame the problem on conservatives, liberals, Republicans, or Democrats, and the conversation will quickly disintegrate into angry comebacks. But it, is it really a person's ideological group that is to blame for problems in making change? No, because people can act reasonably regardless of party affiliation. They simply choose not to act in a more reasonable manner out of fear. Here's a final thought experiment to drive the point home. Imagine for a moment, you travel to a state in the U.S. where you do not live. You walk into a coffee shop and begin talking about the candidate of your liking with another patron who likes the opposing candidate. The chances are good that as you hear in the conversation that this random stranger is for the other side, your blood pressure will begin to rise, which is a preemptive fear response making you more alert. And you will automatically, from that point on, have an attitude of circumspection about that person. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you would handle it in this theoretical situation with complete zen or mindfulness, though I doubt it. Why do we get angry at each other? Why do we automatically become wary of complete strangers when all they have said is, I think I like Donald Trump, or I think Hillary Clinton is the better of the two bad choices? Fear. Fear that the opposing person is going to win, or that the opposite party candidate will irreparably damage your way of life. It is absolutely true that the President of the United States has great power. The president can influence our country and the world in both word and deed. I would propose, therefore, that it is reasonable to have a fear response when talking with someone if you distrust their candidate choice. Fear is, again, a healthy response to perceived threats, past, present, or future. The more important question is, do we really need to become so hijacked by our fear that we lash out in anger at each other and treat each other with contempt about politics? Does it really help us solve problems and move the country forward? I've discussed this question with about 10 of my psychologist friends and dozens of acquaintances across the spectrum of professions all over the U.S. The net result of almost, you know, 60 or so conversations was a statement something like this. Well, of course, we don't need to yell at each other. But why wouldn't people lose it when, you know, someone is ignorantly supporting blank, who is such a horrible, scary, temperamental, deplorable, shifty, untrustworthy person? That's the template. That's what showed up in almost 60 conversations. Their answers always included some statement about how reasonable it would be to get hijacked because people are afraid of something bad happening on election day. 
almost as if the world were going to come to an end. As a citizen of this democratic republic kind of country, it would seem obvious to be invested in the candidate of your choice. The more we yell at each other and shoot passive-aggressive barbs back and forth across the table or the bar, the greater the divide becomes between us, and it reinforces our need to be afraid of those voting for the opposite party. This process of losing it on each other halts any ability to have a reasonable discussion of issues and arrive at a point of conciliance. There is also a plethora of secondary or sub-issues within the bipartisan problem, like greed, special interest groups, foreign relations, religion, and general ignorance. I will, however, not be exploring those issues because many authors of note have discussed them at length. Moreover, if I were to discuss those subtopics, my personal biases and beliefs would become a factor and distract you from the truly important objective arguments I'm making here. I do not wish to throw my bias into the ring because the psychology of fear, examined objectively to the degree that that's possible, as it relates to our relationship to politics, is the real focus of this section. A second major topic that is important to discuss political bias free, is how our culture has become obsessed with making progress driven by governmental influence. Culture of progress. At first glance, this subsection title might seem like an attack on liberal or democratic party views, but it's not. This is not a critique of either dominant political philosophy. I am, however, making the statement that U.S. political culture has become unhealthily obsessed with either making or resisting progress. Take, for example, the last 20 years of news coverage about the U.S. Congress. Almost like clockwork, when Congress has been in session, there have been multiple stories about how, quote-unquote, nothing was accomplished today because some group of senators filibustered or congressmen couldn't agree on a compromise regarding some law, budget, or issue. Isn't that absolutely astounding? In a country like the U.S., this uh, phenomenon is baffling to me. The people of the U.S. have a history of rebelling against intransigent political systems, like autocracies and monarchies, fighting for civil rights and developing a more reasonable and free way of being. Yet now, we have tied our own hands with our inherent bias towards keeping it the way we like it or making it better than it is. My essential argument is that our political system, driven by our national and individual fear problem, has been hijacked by a culture of progress and concomitant countercultures. Let's examine this progress phenomenon more closely. You might be thinking to yourself, well, why is this bad? I'm not arguing that a desire for progress is inherently bad. Change is a necessity for any culture or individual to survive and thrive. It is more than reasonable to want a better life. The question that always comes to mind when I hear people crying out for progress or change driven by the political establishment is this. What is the actual state of progress or change in the U.S.? It's important to know whether the situation is really as bad as it sounds. Often, Social and political problems are examined by the media or by ourselves, using only one narrow-minded perspective, which can make the problem seem worse than it might be. Perhaps the situation is still not ideal, but much better than it has been in the past. The second question I would then raise is, what is the rate of progress and change compared to the rest of the world? One problem I believe many individuals and organizations in the U.S. struggle with is an ethnocentric or Eurocentric view of cultural progress. If the litmus test for progress is simply the current state of affairs here in the U.S. or very progressive countries in Europe, then I think we truly don't know how bad the state of progress truly is. Issues like cultural discrimination, poverty, 
and healthcare are common progress topics discussed by both dominant political philosophies. So let's focus on just one of these common progress topics and try to examine just how bad the state of progress is in the U.S. Again, please try to judge my arguments for their soundness and clarity, and not simply based upon your gut reaction to them. Your personal experience of discrimination, like my own, do not factor into the veracity of the arguments or the existence of the facts. Prejudice and Progress for LGBTQIA Individuals The umbrella topic of discrimination here in the United States is often taken up by both major political philosophies, sometimes agreeing on sub-issues, but typically disagreeing. Again, I'm not here to pick a side. This is simply an example of how organizations and individuals on both sides of the political spectrum, aided by the media, capitalize on people's emotionality using conjecture and Machiavellian spins on facts to either push for change or keep the status quo. When it comes to discrimination, the three biggest groups who typically are discussed in the U.S. are ethnic and racial minorities, LGBTQIA individuals, and women. Many of you, like myself, belong to one or more of these groups and might have had a negative or discriminatory experience. This evaluation I'm making is simply a factual exploration of the problem, not an argument against any of your or my own lived experiences of discrimination, and believe me, I have been discriminated against. For the sake of simplicity, let's just pick one group and talk about how bad it is for said group simply based upon the facts. I would like to focus on the challenges faced by the LGBTQIA community because I'm a member of it. As we explore the problems and the facts, try to notice the relative score sheet of facts showing improvement for our queer friends versus the existence of problematic or regressive phenomenon. Then, I will discuss the overall rate of progress and assess how bad it really is for LGBTQIA people based upon my interpretation of the facts. I propose that we evaluate the problems faced by the LGBTQIA community in the U.S. from the perspective of three commonly accepted social justice research domains. Basic human needs, such as shelter, basic safety, sanitation, and finances. Opportunity, such as legal change, research on acceptability, financial success, perceived discrimination, and essential components of well-being, perceived wellness, basic health, and access to information and resources. Regarding basic human needs, individuals in the U.S. and the LGBTQIA community typically do not struggle with maintaining nutrition, sanitation, money, or shelter. However, a significant proportion of homeless youth identify as somewhere on the queer spectrum. This implies that a significant number of queer-identified youth are either choosing to leave their houses due to actual or perceived prejudice slash discrimination from family or community, or that they are kicked out of their houses for many reasons. Already, you can see that while some basic aspects of the LGBTQA experience are on the positive side, some are not. Regarding opportunity, the second category, there are many complex issues. For instance, when it comes to advocacy and legal issues, the LGBTQI community has had some success in the past decades in the U.S. with the striking down of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and nationally legalizing gay marriage. There are also very clear anti-discrimination laws in place regarding the hiring and firing of individuals solely due to sexual identity, although not all states in the union have their own laws. Unfortunately, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, found that there was a 28% increase in the number of allegations of wrongful firing based upon sexual identity in 2015. However, only approximately 48% of those cases were deemed fitting for remediation, as in justified. A study from 2013 also found essentially no discrimination in four major U.S. cities when it comes to hiring LGBTQA individuals. Yet another study 
found that 15% of LGBTQA individuals experience workplace discrimination based upon sexuality. So let's take a quick pause and evaluate just this one set of facts I presented to you regarding LGBTQA employment discrimination. On the one hand, there was an increase in the number of allegations. Many people would stick with that one fact alone and make catastrophizing statements. Then, we must evaluate the rest of the facts. Less than half of the cases were legitimate. If you were to look at the EEOC website listed in the references of this book, you would find that more cases were resolved compared to the prior year, which is a good thing, and more people rightfully compensated for their experiences of discrimination. In summary, on the one hand, it is a problem that people are still being wrongfully fired. However, the number of LGBTQA people wrongfully fired is decreasing and more LGBTQA individuals are both advocating for themselves, as in they feel safe enough to stand up for themselves now, and are being adequately compensated for their experience of discrimination. Mixed bag, right? The point is, some issues still exist. Prejudice exists, but it all depends upon how you look at the facts and you compare the trends in the data. Regarding the final category of wellness, there are many ways to evaluate the progress and continued problems in the LGBTQA community. Perceived social support is one way of looking at wellness. One study found that most gay and bisexual individuals felt supported despite perceived discrimination socially or experientially. Another study found, focusing on African-American homosexuals, that 63% experienced some form of discrimination, but that close to 90% felt included in their community. Another study found that smoking among female queer-identified youth was higher than the same age prevalence for heterosexual female youth. But queer-identified female youth engaged and actively participated in gay-friendly spaces were actually much less likely to smoke. An LGBTQA survey group found that approximately 75% of queer-identified youth did not feel accepted by their peers. And... 77% believe that things will continually get better for the gay community. That same study, however, showed that queer-identified youth are twice as likely to be bullied or assaulted compared to heterosexual peers. And 42% said they did not feel accepted by the community at large. An article in the Huffington Post last year cited an advocacy group's findings that approximately 14 people were murdered purportedly due to their LGBTQA identity, again, last year being in 2016. Likely, the number of hate-motivated murders were underreported, which is my opinion, and it was difficult to find reliable data on the topic. So the above sections are a representative snapshot of how far LGBTQA individuals have come with regard to well-being and what struggle still persists. I admit that the facts and figures I cited above are by no means exhaustive or perfectly representative of all the important statistics. I think it would be a reasonable or fair statement to make that the numbers have gone up for positive statistics, like perceived acceptance, and down for negative statistics, like number of wrongful firings or hate crimes. Now, how about the rate of progress here in the U.S.? Based upon the facts above, it would be wise to compare how well LGBTQA individuals are doing here relative to other marginalized groups in the U.S. Not that the issues, biases, or barriers are in any way the same. It is also necessary to see how quickly things are changing and how good the state of affairs is here for LGBTQA folks compared to other nations. Progress rate comparison in the U.S. To compare the rate of progress here in the U.S., we can perform many logical maneuvers. For instance, we could compare the number of legal or social victories for the LGBTQA population since the country's inception and simply see how far things have advanced in the last 240 or so years. Then we could break it down more finely by topic or by year. 
Or we could look at the number of hate crimes in the last year compared to the previous decade. If we look at the LGBTQA legal progress since this country's inception, the most obvious statement one could make is that queer identified individuals had zero protections in 1776. Now, as of 2016, gay marriage is legal. Anti-discrimination laws are in place for many sectors of society, education, employment, finance, and roughly 30 states have sexual orientation and gender hate crime laws on the books. Broadly speaking, it would be fair to assert that the country has made significant progress in its relatively short lifespan, with most of the progress occurring in the last 30 years since the passage of the Hate Crime Statistics Act in 1990 under George Bush Sr. Not so conservative, eh? Essentially, for around 200 years, LGBTQIA individuals have had minimal to no equal or special legal protection in the U.S. Unfortunately, I could not find any hard numbers on how many LGBTQIA individuals have been denied employment, financial support, wrongfully fired, assaulted, or murdered since 1776, or even since the 90s when the LGBTQIA advocacy was beginning to explode in uh, this country. I cannot in good conscience describe any kind of progression or regression for LGBTQA well-being simply given the lack of data. Economically speaking, it's difficult to discern relative privilege or hardship given the number of closeted individuals in the workforce. One older study, however, showed that gay men typically earn a 32% less compared to their heterosexual males and that roughly 64% of trans-identified individuals earn roughly $25,000 a year, well below the poverty line. Given the lack of historical data on LGBTQIA incomes and economic opportunity, I, again, cannot make a statement about whether or not our queer-identified peers have made progress economically. Obviously, it's bad that the number of trans-identified individuals are in poverty. But... Hopefully, that represents a decrease compared to 50 years ago. Until we have more data, the numbers simply represent current assessments, not trajectories of change. The trend in the data is more important for making a judgment about how to move forward with policy change and fearful responses. The basic LGBTQIA historical outline in the U.S. is this. More people are out. More people are engaging in advocacy more people are being treated with respect, more people have rights. Generally, it seems like gay rights in every sector are on an upward trend. Rates of progress around the world. The next step is to compare the rate of LGBTQIA progress in the U.S. against the rest of the world. This comparison, however, might be more difficult because many countries are so varied in their cultural, geographic, legal, religious, and economic profile that many circumstantial factors will speed up or slow their rate of progress. If we take the amount of progress the U.S. has made in its very brief 240-year history, in the context of what centuries the U.S. was formed, how knowledge has spread and societies have advanced in that time and then compare it to other countries who are older or younger, more or less economically stable, religiously run versus secularly oriented, more or less dense in terms of population, this evaluation process gets very messy. As we've seen, the U.S. has made many advances in legal protection and freedoms for the LGBTQIA population, as we've already discussed. According to results published by the Human Rights Campaign, it seems as if many cultures are more rapidly pushing for LGBTQIA rights. As of the beginning of 2016, over 19 countries had full marriage equality for LGBTQIA individuals, and Chile, Cyprus, Greece passed civil union laws. Now, that only represents 11% of the countries in the world, with major world powers like Russia and China missing from the pro-gay rights movement. Moreover, multiple Southeast Asian countries like Thailand and Vietnam have passed equal protection rights for trans individuals. According to the statistics from the World Economic Forum, LGBTQA individuals and companies bring in about $3 trillion annually. 
Another interesting finding is that over two-thirds of Fortune 500 companies have anti-discrimination policies in place. Many of these advances in worldwide LGBTQIA progress have been initiated in the last 30 years. Essentially, all the advancements for our queer-identified fellow man and woman and they that countries have made have only happened recently. If we examine just these few facts, it seems like the U.S. is at least on par with, if not ahead of, many countries that are much older and have been established and functioning in a civilized manner for much longer than the U.S. The main premise of this chapter is how much fear we need to have to let inform our behavior. In this particular section, I've been discussing the problem of politically driven pushes for progress and the resulting countercultures. Looking at just one major group striving for politically and socially driven progress, the LGBTQIA culture, it seems as if there are still many problems and prejudices that require advocacy and political change. On the other hand, looking at the facts, it seems like queer identified people in the U.S. have it good compared to many other parts of the world. The U.S. does not appear to be falling behind or regressing, but is actually progressing at a reasonable or comparable rate. I would therefore propose that for those of us concerned about the LGBTQA community and their progress in the world, there is much work to be done, but we do not need to maintain the alarmist attitude that many citizens continue to hold on to. Living in a fear-based attitude only makes us feel worse and typically promotes progressive rights fighters to take action that alienates people on either side of the argument, which in turn causes a surge in anti-progress movements. So, what's the solution? I believe we need mindful advocacy and healthy discussion between ideological opponents, which I will discuss in greater detail in a later chapter. Religion the third factor that seems to play a large role in the divisiveness and fear-based living of billions of people the world over is religion. Again, I want to remind you that this is not a diatribe against religion. I am not attempting to convince you God doesn't exist or to give up your beliefs. My hope is to show you how your reactions to the world around you, mediated by your religious beliefs, might be on the unnecessarily fearful side of the spectrum. Please keep your religion and your religious beliefs because I'm sure they're very helpful for you in many ways. I'm simply asking you to read on and ask yourself if you might be overreacting because of some of the stories and concepts you learn from your religious tradition. Religion is a uniquely human phenomenon. Though some may believe there is a wide variety of religious differences, Many religions actually share similar concepts or beliefs at their core. There are anywhere between 200 and 4,300 various religions or subtypes of major religions. Christianity purportedly has the most followers, roughly 2 billion, and Islam has the second most, roughly 1.5 billion, according to various polls and sources. Of the roughly 7.5 billion people on the planet, approximately half belong to basically two groups— I want to add one caveat before I delve into my main arguments here. Religion and spirituality are very different concepts. While they may seem like similar concepts, if you look at their literal roots, you will see some interesting fundamentals emerge. Look at spirituality as it's derived from a literal belief of spirits or spiritual beings. There are actually no substantive factual arguments, no proof for either for or against belief in spirits. We just can't tell if they exist. In fact, recently there have been a few evolving conversations among physicists and other scholars about the quantum nature of particles and how spirits of different kinds of consciousness may be related to our quantum nature. But so far, that's all theoretical and nonsensical. What's important to keep in mind, however, is that these arguments between physicists and other scholars are purely theoretical. No physicist or sane scholar is making statements like get more spiritual or people who don't believe in spirits are in peril or kill non-believers simply because it might be a possibility that spirits exist. 
It is therefore not wise to blame people's beliefs and spirits and spirituality simply because we don't know that they exist. No one is claiming to know anything with any real certainty, especially not me. Plus, when is the last time you heard of someone randomly murdering someone else because they believed spirits exist? I doubt your yoga teacher is out mass murdering anyone in the name of the divine essence or something like that. For a better understanding of what spirituality is from a scientific perspective, I would recommend reading books like Waking Up by Sam Harris. My goal here is not to argue the plethora of definitions and validity of ideas, just to note that two concepts are different pragmatically speaking with different consequences typically. Religion, on the other hand, is a readily observable social construct that organizes people based upon their beliefs and rituals about spirits or gods. Religion is a set of firmly held guiding principles broadcast throughout a group of like-minded individuals about how we ought to live based upon one notions of spirits and gods. Every religion has their own set of guiding principles that people use to develop their sense of morality, which informs the way they behave. Orthodox Jews have their 213 laws. Islam contains dozens of laws about diet, sanitation, worship, money, work, and other areas of life that are very important, contained within their holy books, the Quran and the Hadith. Christianity has the Ten Commandments, dozens of verses in the books of Proverbs, and over 1,050 commandments in the New Testament attributed to the apostles, God, and Jesus Christ. Buddhism has the Eightfold Path. Hinduism is slightly more ambiguous and subjectivist in its approach for prescribing a way of life based upon the dynamics of your karma and your dharma. Jainism has approximately 35 rules of conduct. Essentially, depending upon which religious system you choose, you are either encouraged or mandated to live a very different lifestyle. And here lies the problem with religion. Not a particular religion, though some religions believers have created more negative consequences than others at various periods in history. The problem with religion is twofold, and all because people choose to act in irrational or fear-driven ways based upon their beliefs. There is the problem of grouping in religion and then the problem of irrational validity. As we have already seen in the discussion of politics, when people begin grouping themselves based upon beliefs, then the most natural consequence of self-grouping is that outgroups are created and conflict ensues. There's a great quote from the movie Men in Black, where one agent played by Tommy Lee Jones states, A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it, to Will Smith. The question prior to that quote in the movie asked why the government just doesn't let the public know that aliens exist. The character played by Tommy Lee Jones is simply implying, rather poignantly, that our herd mentality kicks in when we group up and are presented with threats. Like it or not, we are still animals in many ways. When people believe their religious ways of being are being attacked by an outgroup, then it naturally causes people to react in fear and live defensively, or proactively seek out and destroy those who theoretically threaten or oppose them. All religions, like philosophies, struggle with the problem of rationality and credibility and validity. The argument I'm making here is similar to the credibility arguments made by Bertrand Russell, proposed in the 1900s. Essentially, there are such widely varying and contradictory religious beliefs and practices across and within religions, which are supported by minimal or no substantive scientific proof for why those beliefs are best, often, or often enough, these varying religious beliefs have resulted in countless deaths, prejudice, and cultural divisiveness. It then makes sense based upon the premises of the grouping problem, that there are people wary of a particular religion, which is the outgroup, or wary of religion in general, which is kind of like the meta-outgroup. Unfortunately, many participants in religious belief or religious belief system have not 
engage in any kind of intensive study about the true origins of their belief system and are not quite fully aware of the historical and political context that drove the development of their religion. Without a full understanding of something, we tend to have very surface or superficial beliefs. Superficial beliefs are often easily challenged and highly inflammatory. In terms of credibility, it is worth noting that most religions were created in a period before advanced scientific understanding of events like disease, earthquakes, weather, and other natural phenomena. Creating a belief system or even a way of life based upon a minimal understanding of how things work and fear-based cultural norms does not actually promote the most mindful, inclusive, or critically thought through way of living. Knowing what you know about how things work now, why does it make sense to base your behavior on belief systems created in the Bronze Age. For example, slavery was once widely accepted and is highly promoted in most Abrahamic religious texts. However, through socially and scientifically informed moral reasoning, we now have decided that slavery is wrong. Moreover, in most societies, we also no longer believe that we should kill people for disobedience for parents or for infidelity or for homosexuality, though unfortunately it still happens. Now, the arguments I just made about the irrationality of religiously driven behavior are both broad and seemingly inflammatory. I hope, however, that you see my point and can understand that my goal is to show the discrepancy in our individual thinking. Many of us who appreciate and value religious beliefs do not hold to some of the more arcane moral imperatives of the Abrahamic texts because our moral reasoning is much more advanced now that we have, let's say, all had some time to talk about and reflect on these various religious precepts. I think it would be fair to say that most Christians, Jews, and Muslims are not out killing children for misbehavior because they do not see that the murder of the disobedient child is a credible or reasonable moral behavior. I also want to point out that there are many moral and virtuous components to all religions. Jainist, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic texts all contain very pragmatic and very moral philosophies. The problem is that amidst those moral commands, there are those immoral behaviors that are advocated for purportedly by God that a subset of the religious world do not let go of in most religions, except for maybe Jainism and Buddhism. The human interpretation of religious texts at one time advocated for what we now consider destructive behavior. That's a problem. Because we are human, we all have illogical fears and prejudices. Some passage in a holy book advocating murder or marginalization might open a door for acting out our illogical fears or prejudices with sometimes disastrous consequences. ISIS is a perfect example of this. Because of the many prescriptions for violence in the Quran and the Hadith, specifically about jihad and spreading the faith to the rest of the world, extremist groups like ISIS are more likely to form in the name of Islamic faith. On the other side of the spectrum, you don't hear of Jains going out and bombing each other or non-believers because nowhere in Jainist texts do you find prescriptions for violence. Actually, quite the opposite. I'll admit that this is a, well, a radical oversimplification of a complex global phenomenon like ISIS and how it developed due to geopolitical and historical forces. But the basic reasoning is correct. If our version of God advocates for some behavior people in the outgroup consider immoral, it stands to reason that we feel less obliged to mindfully check our motives or care about the true magnitude of the consequences resulting out of our behavior. When you combine the grouping problem, causing countercultures and wars of ideas, with the lack of credibility problem, a fear-based dynamic develops. Even very reasonable religious people who don't hate their ideological opponents are prone to closing their minds when their beliefs are challenged. Many religious people 
tend to dig in their heels and say, because God created my belief system, it cannot be wrong. This makes sense because the biggest religions tend to believe a lack of faith will send you to hell, which sounds very scary. This process of religion, self-sustaining and rationalizing its validity with circular reasoning due to fear is a problem. No one likes it when their beliefs are questioned, but this should not be a reason to become recalcitrant and aggressive. This proactive, aggressive defensiveness, i.e. closed-mindedness, seen in religious reactors when challenged, combined with the grouping phenomenon, means easy conflict all over the world. This is the problem with our fear-driven adherence to religions and religious principles. It induces closed-mindedness, which ultimately results in conflict. Interestingly, some research is now showing that people with damaged frontal areas of the brain, similar to how fear short circuits our frontal lobe, actually become more zealous about their religion. This showcases the infinite loop problem I'm discussing. Fear about religious belief and judgment is a kind of a less thinking uh, frontal cortex shutoff, which results in more fear, which results in more shutoff. While this section addressed the problems with religion, I want to restate that this is not a refutation of religion per se. I made some statements that do provide a basis for refuting religion. However, the goal is to show the ideological or philosophical issues in practicing the most commonly adhered to religions that typically result in conflict from both believers and non-believers and how that creates an intractable fear-driven conflict loop. What I'm discussing is our very normal and human fear response, especially when we have certain understanding of things when most of us are confused about the why of life, the inconsistency of beliefs about our existential experience, this results from being told to live on faith and having our beliefs constantly challenged is all resulting in this big cycle. The problem is simply fear. Fear that our reliance on faith or religion is wrong. Fear that our religion will be taken away. Reactive aggressive fear because God wants us to do or believe in things the world at large disagrees with and criticizes on a regular basis. Imagine simply having faith-based beliefs or religious beliefs and not feeling like you must defend or spread them. What would that require? Well, I'll discuss this more in my solutions chapter at the end of the book. Generally, what would be of utmost value for ending this religion-driven fear problem is humbly acknowledging the limits of what we know and emphasizing that we are all human and deserve basic human respect and care, regardless of our religious beliefs. This is typically, however, a tall order. Greed. One of the more fundamental problems discussed the world over is money, and specifically greed. Indeed, one recent theory of civil war development, i.e. intra-country conflict, highlights how economic disparity born out of greed should be considered a primary driving force. There are over 100 songs about wealth and money, thousands of investment firms, dozens of government agencies, schools of academic study devoted entirely to the art and science of making money, and countless other industries focused purely on helping people make money. There's this great song from the musical Cabaret titled Money Makes the World Go Round. Within the lyrics of this song are some ironically deep philosophical truths about how most people on the planet see and deal with money. The lyrics state that money helps us have fun, deal with relationship loss, escape problems, and ultimately allows us to eat and have warmth. It seems to be particularly accurate when songs or literature assert that money is equated to a panacea for life's problems. So how does this seemingly reasonable utility of money that we all understand metamorphose into greed in many Western countries, as well as major Eastern world powers. Well, before we delve into the fear-driven process of greed development and how it's commonly occurring in countries like the U.S., I think a clear definition of greed is important. There are numerous connotations that immediately arise in the mind when we hear the word greed. Maybe we think of unfairness or selfishness, or... Greed can elicit the image of egomaniacal or money-grubbing individuals. 
The Oxford Dictionary defines greed as the intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. I find this definition to be interesting because it specifies the criteria of intensity and selfishness in terms of the intention and manner of acquisition of money, and not simply just having amassed wealth. It stands to reason that someone who makes billions of dollars only to give a large portion of it away would not be characterized as selfish and not then considered greedy. Or, on the other hand, someone who slowly and mindfully accumulates a large amount of money would also not be considered greedy because it doesn't meet the qualifier of intensity. Given this definition and understanding of greed, it seems reasonable to discuss the consequences commonly associated with greed-driven behavior. However, that will be saved for the next few chapters on the individual and cultural consequences of fear. One more caveat. The purpose of this subsection discussing fear gone awry, as evidenced by more and more people acting in a greedy manner, is not to advocate for a communist model of economics. I'm neither arguing for or against any economic system. There are dozens and dozens of scholars who have written about economies and economics that can argue about this more fluently and accurately, and I have no desire to misrepresent my knowledge. I hope to provide a psychological and evolutionary perspective on why a certain percent of the population is engaged in greedy behavior or is driven by greed. So, how does greed develop? Again, the simple answer is evolutionary needs gone awry. The complex version about how our evolutionary need to survive and thrive is slightly lengthier. The formula goes like this. Misperceived necessity plus opportunity plus fear equals greed. I'll say that again. The formula for greed is this. Misperceived necessity plus opportunity plus fear equals greed. Regarding necessity, when it comes to survival in the last, let's say, 4,000 years, we typically have needed to engage in hunting or bartering to survive because bartering is a great way to get what you need. Bartering resulted in the development of money or currency around roughly 3,000 years ago, which then opened the door for individuals to amass currency. If you thumb backwards a few pages, you will see the discussion in the previous chapter about the bioevolutionary origins of fear and how we manage our fear behaviorally. At this point, I hope it has become obvious that the necessity for engaging in survival-oriented activities to ward off fear is relatively common. Regarding our discussion of social symptoms of fear gone awry, one of the most common manifestations behaviorally is what I've labeled proactive aggressive fear, which is akin to the fight response of the fight flight freeze process biologists and psychologists use to conceptualize animal fear response strategies. I propose that our proactive aggressive fear resolution strategy underlies greed. I guess the next question would be, why do we need to engage in this strategy nowadays? I think the common belief in most cultures goes something like this. If I have more money, my life will generally be better. Well, let's take a step back and survey the global landscape and see why that belief might get hijacked by fear. We now have rapid development of social communication and other technology, which is speeding up how quickly we conduct business and economic growth, as well as social expectations about how quickly we amass wealth and how much money we need to have, such as keeping up with the Joneses. Moreover, there have been dramatic increases in intercultural contact, which can reasonably be a cause for socially induced fear. See the religious argument above and the grouping problem. With the world population growth rate increasing, it simply means more people need to consume more resources more quickly, which requires more money, which in turn fuels the supply and demand dynamic discussed by economists. If you combine these factors, it would make sense that more people wish to accumulate more wealth at every level of socioeconomic strata. More money 
typically equates to more agency and freedom to enjoy life. I imagine lower SES individuals would like more financial security as well as a better standard of living, whereas moderate to high SES individuals wish to have an even nicer standard of living and increase their social capital. Still, how does this turn into what has been described as greed? When we think about greed, typically we associate such conniving and selfish behavior with large corporations, especially those focused on selling us goods and services. But is it fair to pin the greed phenomenon on big businesses? I dare say no, and the rationale is simple. If we consider greed and not wealth accumulation as a kind of hedonistically fear-driven phenomenon with the goal of thriving at the expense of others' welfare, then it stands to reason that anyone who selfishly hoards money or usurps money is contributing to the greed problem. Now, economics is a tricky science. To give a theoretical example and adequately describe all the social and economic forces would not be pragmatic for the purposes of this work. The idea of hoarding money implies that said money is not being spent on necessary or important goods, services, or people. So a billion dollar corporation would be considered greedy if a reasonable percent of the profit was not spent on necessities like employees, salaries, insurance, product improvement, infrastructure investment, employee wellness needs, or maintaining a fair and healthy relationship with their customers, i.e. providing reasonable services that customers need and not conning their customers. The perfect example of this big business greed process is the housing bubble bursting in 2008 in the U.S. due to subprime mortgage catastrophes. The short-term gains, i.e. greed, desired by the bankers and major companies, investment firms, and real estate developers, nicely commingled and resulted in mortgage offerings to individuals who wanted to capitalize on their fear-driven desire to have a better life. Greedily trying to live beyond one's means with a bigger or nicer house. This resulted in thousands defaulting on their mortgages due to questionably structured mortgage payment plans, as well as insufficient funds in the parts of the banks and the buyers. Both parties were guilty of greed in this example. In the same way, it would be fair to consider an individual of lower SES greedy if said individual were to avoid spending their money on necessities for themselves or their children, and instead selfishly engage in hedonistic behaviors such as drinking, smoking, gambling, or buying nice clothing when their kids go hungry. Or simply just tucking the money away without a plan for saving. This can all be considered greedy behavior. Greed is the outgrowth of fear gone awry. We spend too much time keeping up with the Joneses and too little time meditating and budgeting out our financial needs. As the Oxford Dictionary definition states, greed is not only about wealth, but also commonly revolves around issues of power or accumulation of goods. If any of us were to begin amassing goods, such as food, at the expense of the people in a given area, then we might consider that greed as well. For decades now, researchers have been following the behavior of survivors of the Holocaust during World War II, and what they have found is quite fascinating. A significant percentage of Holocaust survivors, as well as those from other traumatic enslavement and social thinning environments, have been found to hoard food, though there is some controversy about how often this happens. Why? Well, because the traumatic nature of starvation and having one's life threatened altered these individual stress response or fear response. Now, when you think of a stereotypical picture of a Holocaust survivor, I'm sure you aren't imagining someone greedily keeping food at the expense of their family or community's welfare, right? Food hoarding is, after all, a relatively common phenomenon in the animal kingdom, and it tends to be adaptive because it helps us develop specialized survival memory faculties. The truth is, however... This desire to amass food is driven by an irreparably altered fear system in these Holocaust survivors. It makes sense that if the object of your fear for years on end was whether you would be fed by your captors or not, eventually your natural fear response related to hunger pains would get hijacked and overwhelmed by the circumstances. 
It's akin to your car being stuck in high gear going 80 miles per hour. Even though you are stepping on the brakes in a 20 mile per hour zone because the accelerator software in your car's computer is broken. Do we consider Holocaust survivors greedy? Absolutely not. The hoarding of food has negligible consequences for the individual and their family compared to the massive personal and societal consequences seen in the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. Technically, both are greed behaviors and both are driven by fear. The general point is that our fear-driven need to keep money at the expense of our own and another's well-being is a problem. When we observe others being greedy, we in turn become hijacked by fear and engage in quasi-greed-driven behavior or behavior to counter greed, which in turn creates societal conflict and perpetuates fear. Summary. A lot of ground has been covered in this chapter. I have made the argument thus far that we have an evolutionarily adaptive fear response, a normal biological reaction to perceived or actual threat. While this natural biological reaction is mostly adaptive, we have changed so much as a species that our circumstances have afforded us a more complex and quicker way of living. I propose that when humans functioned in more primal and tribal ways, which still exist as social or cultural norms in some parts of the world, having a more fear-driven way of being helped us evolve and survive successfully. The premise here is that Although we were designed and have been socialized to function in more primal ways, our current global climate, combined with the advances in technology, education, human rights, and morality, require a more sophisticated approach to our fear response. Specifically, I propose that our fear response has been hijacked or co-opted by four phenomena, technology, politics, religion, and greed. Technology, religion, and greed, and politics all serve or have served a very adaptive purpose in our world. Technology and greed have afforded such intense connection and rapid socio-cultural and economic development that society is advancing at a pace like we have never seen in recorded history. The problem, however, is that such intense connection and such rapid change means we are exposed to each other more often and learn more quickly, which relates to the next two problems. Regarding religion and politics, the basic problem is the same. These two methods of social relating and negotiating are based upon more tribalistic, kind of us versus them, ways of relating, which will always cause fear-based divisiveness and result in ostracism or aggression. The inherent problem with tribalism in most parts of the world is that we simply do not culturally or socially function that way anymore. Although we are biologically programmed to live in a quasi-tribalistic manner because it helped us survive, it seems as if global society, not to be confused with globalism, is moving away from our evolutionary urge for tribalism. As we learn more, relate more quickly, and advance in more sophisticated ways, thanks to technology, our more primitive brain is left in the dust. This means... We are at a crucial point in our evolutionary and cultural development. We need to learn how to adapt to our changing circumstances. I am not advocating, however, that we simply give up on religion, politics, making money, or creating new and exciting technology. I am not saying we should all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I am simply hoping we can begin to have an intellectually honest discussion about how much our fear response has been both hijacked by and left in the dust by these four phenomena. At the end of the book, I will propose some concrete and simple methods for either de-escalating fear hijacking or helping our evolutionary instinct catch up to our current state of development. In the meantime, I would like to take the opportunity to outline the consequences of our unchecked fear for us all starting with the consequences to ourselves as individuals. Chapter 5. Consequences to the Individual Unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later 
in uglier ways, said by Sigmund Freud. Freud's quote seems to be right on for our discussions about fear. The foundation has been laid for understanding how fear works in a very basic manner. It's time to make that case that unchecked fear, the process of allowing our socially learned fears to remain, has consequences for us all on every level of interpersonal and intrapersonal functioning. The simplest place to start on our journey of exploring how unchecked fear affects us all is discuss the implications of not dealing with personal fear on a daily basis. Thus far, I've discussed some examples of personal experiences of fear gone awry. However, I think it would be wise to highlight the most likely common categories and situations wherein we all struggle with unchecked fear individually. I propose that there are three common consequences to individuals as a result of our unchecked fear problem. First, increased interpersonal conflict, leading to decreased social connection. Second, loss of intellectual honesty. Third, maladaptive coping patterns as a result. Increased interpersonal conflict. The first and most compelling problem that our unchecked fear poses to all of us as individuals is a direct increase in interpersonal conflict. My reasoning for saying excess fear leads to conflict is simple. It just makes sense. Because we experience more fear, more intensely, more often, we are less likely to have appropriate coping skills and be utilizing them because we have more fear. It's not as if the world is all of a sudden much scarier than it used to be 50 or even 100 years ago. There are still the same outgroups and disparate ideologies that threaten your way of life. We simply have more awareness and less interest in dealing with the root of the problem, as discussed in the social phenomenon chapter. If you thumb back a few pages or listen back a few seconds to the previous chapter, I outlined how the four major drivers of our unchecked fear, politics, greed, religion, and speedy technological development, promote interpersonal conflict using specific examples. I propose that there is an increase in interpersonal conflict because of our increased rate of interpersonal connection. Why? Well, a great majority of our modern interpersonal connection comes through technology then. Naturally, we have so many more opportunities to relate to each other much more quickly and frequently and discuss so many more hot-button topics. This is the perfect formula for increased interpersonal conflict. A plus B equals C. A equals increased access to new people, cultures, ideas, technology that causes us to B believe we aren't safe, either legitimately feeling threatened or perceived learned threats, or that challenges our ideal way of life. So we have recalcitrance of beliefs and tribalism and identity politics and all that stuff, which represents our illegitimate fear of safety. And this leads to C, more conflict with our friends, coworkers, family members, and people we don't even know. A plus B equals C. Increased access, beliefs related to feeling unsafe, and C is conflict. Think about this. For instance, think about your personal life for the last year. Think about your relationships. If you've lived in the United States, Europe, or Asia, there have been so many political, religious, economic, and social conflicts that have arisen, many of them due to conflicting views about world leaders like President Donald Trump and Putin. Think about the number of discussions or arguments you have had in the past year about politics, social justice issues, or economics. I bet if you tallied up all the arguments about just those four topics, not including more personal arguments, it would total upwards of a few hundred, if not more. If you scroll back to pre-social media times, heck, pre-internet times, I would be willing to bet that there were fewer arguments about these issues, or at least less intense arguments, because life was seemingly simpler and more predictable because we simply did not know about the various conflicts. Essentially, the more we are in contact and the more we learn about things that cause conflict or legitimate fear, 
the more we engage in emotionally intense and biased discussions, which most of us call arguments. Now, I cannot prove that we argue more now compared to 10 years ago or even 100 years ago, frankly, because I have not been able to find any valid polls or research on the topic. I will, however, assert that we likely argue more frequently nowadays because of the reasons described above. Our desire to serve two purposes, tension, relief, and hope for change. Every time we argue, we are likely feeling a sense of anxiety or anger. One of the most normal ways of getting relief from feelings is by talking about them with other people because this engenders a sense of feeling heard by the other, a normal conflict resolution need, which typically promotes a sense of agency. Our sense of agency is driven by our belief that our actions will reliably provide relief or get a useful change. Although it's not necessarily true that we can truly affect our environment to the degree that one would prefer. Although arguing might provide temporary relief because you believe that you have impacted the other person's opinion or behavior, it does not fully relieve you of your fear. For example, arguing with a friend about their political opinion does not change the overall political problem the two of you are engaged in an argument about. The problem is our sense of agency showcased in arguing is really a hedonistic exercise akin to emotional vomiting and not really showcasing morality and coherence because it shows a lack of respect for both yourself and the person on whom you are vomiting your fear. If we engage in arguing, it automatically puts the other person on the defensive, which will not likely help the cause and will cyclically reinforce fear. I think this arguing phenomenon results in a cyclical process of verbal fear vomiting, conflict, and disconnection, and disconnection is the enemy. Arguing about ideas or circumstances is different than a healthy discourse, which I will discuss in the solutions chapter. Loss of intellectual honesty. Due to living in a fear-based mindset, it seems as if all people, regardless of critical thinking capacity or IQ or SES, are reasoning less honestly than in prior generations or in simpler times. I have heard authors like Sam Harris and others mention in their articles and podcasts a similar belief in this current problem. Given all that is happening in the political scene, it seems like we have more and more examples of bad models for intellectual honesty. And the more we have seemingly dishonest leaders, the more culture tends to engage in intellectual dishonesty, it turns out. Unfortunately, I cannot support my rationale for this fear consequence with any fact-based claim or statistics on the increase of intellectual dishonesty in our discourse in the U.S. or other cultures. This is simply both my experience as well as the reported experience of many of my colleagues and acquaintances. The one tangible fact that somewhat supports my belief that we have lost more of our ability to be intellectually honest is the recent development of so-called fake news, scandals, and stories. If the entire gambit of journalists, from major news organizations to lesser-known opinion writers, have been disseminating fake news or unnecessarily biased stories that mislead people with unsubstantiated ideas, it stands to reason that our fear-driven, experiences have led us to a place of desperation to prove our point and ignore other facts that contradict our own point of view. What exactly do I mean by intellectual honesty? When using this phrase, I am describing a way of reasoning that goes beyond simple logic or simple skepticism, though skepticism would go a long way in writing the problem we face right now. I'm proposing that we need to reason in a more honest manner. Simple logic goes like this. Because A happened, then B must be true. A leads to B. However, dozens of factors can account for what happened in A or caused result B. This can be exemplified in any overly simplistic thought. For example, there is a stereotype that African Americans in the U.S. are more often violent, with some research showing that African American youth are more often violent. So, simple 
fact-based, seemingly logical expression that might show up in our conversation goes like this. If African Americans are considered more violent, then it's likely that they're more responsible for or more often involved in violent crime. Looking at other statistics might also confirm this at first glance because, for instance, African Americans in the U.S. were murdered more often by African Americans than any other racial group. Therefore, African Americans must be more violent as a race. This conclusion is simply not true for so many reasons. If you look up the FBI report from the 2013 article which I cited in my theoretical race example, you will see first and foremost that there were more Caucasian murders committed predominantly by Caucasians than there were murders of African Americans. We also do not know about the number of unreported assaults, bar fights, and other violent acts that were never handled by the police or authorities, just never reported. It would also be good to know if this statistic is true in previous years or more recently. Moreover, is this statistic just true in the U.S. or in other countries and around the world? There are so many facts that we simply do not know. A more intellectually honest argument would look at violent crime rates, murder rates, assaults, etc. over a long period of time all over the globe to see if violence is more common among so-called races of any kind, as opposed to focusing on just one type of statistic at one time. Then couple this research with an honest hedge about the sources of the facts, because sources can be biased, and also what is not known at the conclusion of data gathering. This is the kind of argument that is missing in modern discourse nowadays. I believe that we are more interested in picking a side and not thoroughly evaluating that side's argument. We are especially disinterested in any kind of skepticism about our own beliefs because it causes cognitive dissonance and elicits fear, which is an assertion now being supported by research in the social sciences. A desire to fit in and be part of an ideology or social cause, which is not inherently bad, is nowadays more driven by bad logic and a desire to look good at the expense of being honest. I propose that the more fear we experience and the less we deal with it, then the more we push to prove our point or our group's point, even when we have no substantive proof or data. If you recall back to chapter 2 on the brain and fear, the research shows that when we experience fear, our frontal cortices for thinking, reasoning, planning, etc. are more offline, and ironically, when we are stressed or experiencing fear, we automatically access parts of the brain responsible for automatic responding and reflexive, as in not detailed, memories, like what is seen in flashbacks and PTSD. Excessive fear limits our ability to reason honestly and makes us respond in a more reactionary or non-mindful or not thoughtful manner. Therefore, when we are afraid and trying to prove a point, we're not as able to be intellectually honest. This is a cyclical process of feeling fear, which promotes intellectual dishonesty, which promotes arguments that aren't sound, which draws criticism from other people, which makes us feel excluded, which makes us feel afraid because people poke holes in our arguments, which keeps us on the defensive, which keeps us from thinking clearly, which perpetuates fear. We need to break the cycle, which I will discuss in the solutions chapter. Maladaptive coping. Born out of fear, with all of this arguing and not thinking clearly, we eventually are going to do something to alleviate our fear. Given the lack of intellectual honesty and increased interpersonal conflict, our typical circumstances for finding relief, i.e. healthy discussion and care and relationships, are not really at our disposal as reliably as we need them to be. With this in mind, I'd say it makes sense that we have seen an upswing in maladaptive coping methods, with our fear getting out of control all over the world. Generally, the most normal response to feeling overwhelmed is a sort of checking out from reality, which is what my colleagues might call dissociation or denial or avoidance. Each of these labels implies a degree of pathology and a maladaptive process. For the purposes of our discussion, let's just call it checking out, so that the entire spectrum of more adaptive to less adaptive, more pathological to less pathological can be covered. We all check out in various ways, at various times, for both good reasons and bad reasons. I believe that we have taken to checking out a little bit more often, especially in Western cultures, 
due to our widespread fear problem. I'm equating checking out with maladaptive coping here because, as I hope to prove, we're checking out more often and in more problematic ways. Regarding our maladaptive coping problem, it seems like there are two predominant methods that have, let's say, increased in the recent past. One is drug and alcohol use, and two is excessive consumption of media, television, and so on and so forth. Addictions. If you scroll through news articles, Facebook posts, and blog posts over the past 10 years, you would see a dramatic increase in the number of stories describing something new thing as addictive, or a resurgence in worry about how addictive foods and other substances are. It's not an incredulous leap in logic to discuss the drug epidemic and obesity epidemics as related to our increased experience of fear. For example, According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the overall national trends indicate increased drug and alcohol use with large jumps in drug use rates by individuals aged 50 to 60. Addiction is a huge issue in the United States, costing us over $700 billion each year. Moreover, a recent article showed that the rate of heroin overdose quadrupled in the last five years. In the past 20 years, we've also developed many new kinds of addictions, like compulsive shopping, exercising, technology, and sex. Some of these wouldn't have existed without technology, and others have been readily available, for instance, sex addiction and exercise addiction. We can quibble over whether these addictions represent the same kind of national health crisis as heroin and alcohol. However, the general principle is that we've developed all sorts of compulsive habits, that keep us disengaged from healthy relationships and subsequently emotionally checked out. Interesting side note, a man in Japan died from so-called sex addiction because of his outrageously large collection of pornographic magazines, which apparently fell on him and crushed him to death. Just as an FYI. To be clear, I am not proposing that addiction is caused by fear. Addiction is defined as maladaptive compulsive use of drugs, alcohol, and other substances, and the behaviors associated with it are very complex. To fully understand the development of addiction, we would need to discuss genetics, brain development, attachment, affect regulation, and cultural issues, which is outside the scope of this work. I do propose, however, that addiction is a means of checking out, of regulating our emotional state. It makes sense, therefore, that because we are so much more engaged in fear nowadays, so much more often hijacked by our unreasonable social pressures and intellectually dishonest beliefs, we have a more intense and more consistent desire to check out or dissociate. It's also reasonable to believe that because we are working so hard to keep up with today's fast-paced society, we might use alcohol or drugs to enhance our productivity but the fact that it's only enhancing and serves in no way to help de-escalate stress or fear is kind of debatable. The general point is that we're checking out more, much more now than in the past by compulsively using substances and other maladaptive behaviors. Excessive consumption of media. Generally, since the birth of television and movies, we have had a delightful way of entertaining ourselves and a healthy distraction. I would wager, however, that our delightful distraction has become part of our lives, a bigger part of our lives than we are aware. For instance, the average person will spend about four hours per day watching television, which totals out to nine years over the course of their life. Moreover, 49% of people surveyed in those studies said they watched too much television per their report. So what do these numbers mean? Well, to be intellectually honest, one study showed that people between the ages of 18 to 24 are watching less TV nowadays compared to a few years ago. However, though teens are watching less TV, it's fair to say that that time has been switched from TV to other outlets like, say, social media. The most recent academic or research-informed opinion on teenagers and social media is pretty saddening. 
It seems as if teens are literally co-creating an engulfing and damaging environment of electronic connection because it's immediately rewarding, which has grown to the point where teens are now using texting and other social media slash electronic media methods and prefer more than any other kind of communication. Although we're attempting to connect more by constantly updating our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat, I also believe that we're really attempting to check out more from ourselves and our problems. For instance, the average internet user around the world spends about 118 minutes engaged in social media per day, which is likely higher in industrialized countries. That's almost two hours on average. Moreover, people are watching 7 million videos per minute on Snapchat and about 3.5 million texts per minute. Our social media consumption is clearly spinning out of control because in 2005, only 5% of the population used social media, which grew to 15% in 2011, to where, as of January 2017, between 70 and 80% of people in the U.S. actively maintain a social media profile. Most people in the U.S. are literally using two hours of the day on social media, which could be spent connecting with loved ones, working out, or meditating. I propose that all this time online results in a one specific negative consequence, more pain. More time spent on social networking sites and apps means less face time with people. This is particularly problematic in my opinion because, again, we are biologically programmed to want to connect in real and meaningful ways with others, as in in real life. Although there is an aspect of meaningfulness to spending time and sharing with each other on social media, it is not nearly as real or as intensely meaningful due to the virtual nature of the connection. Though some might wish to philosophically debate this point, which I welcome. Given that we're connecting less often in real ways, we're likely feeling lonelier as individuals, which would reasonably cause us to cope in a maladaptive manner to deal with the psychological pain of disconnection. That may sound somewhat dramatic, but think about it. If the rate of opioid, i.e. pain medication, abuse has steadily gone up in this country, it is really kind of confusing to think that maybe is it all that unreasonable to believe that our more technologically induced isolationist lifestyle plays no part in it? You tell me. For decades now, we've been experiencing greater and more consistent disconnection which means we likely are feeling more pain due to said disconnection. This is a topic I would greatly appreciate the chance to discuss with anyone. However, as of this point in 2017 when I'm writing this, I propose that our drug, alcohol, and other maladaptive coping behaviors through sex, technology, and obsessing on social media will continue to be on the rise because of our increased disconnection from each other. Whether it be because we're simply looking at screens too often while in the company of others, or whether our technology use is simply keeping us isolated emotionally and less reliant on in-person and face-to-face -face connection. Summary. The long and short of my argument here is simple. Our hijacked, i.e. oversensitive and overactive fear response has led us to disconnect more, reason less honestly, and cope more compulsively. The sad thing is, these three adaptations to our hijacked fear response do not solve the problem. It stands to reason that social disconnection, poor reasoning, and compulsive behavior only make us feel worse, which then cyclically reinforces our hijacked fear response. Due to the fact that the biggest consequence to us as individuals from our hijacked fear response is a feeling making things worse, there is a negative view in our cultures and the countries in which we live of it which will be discussed in the next chapter. Chapter 6. Consequences to Culture People who think with their epidermis or their genitalia or their clan are the problem to begin with. One does not banish this specter by invoking it. If I would not vote against someone on the grounds of race or gender alone, then by that exact same token, I would not cast a vote in his or her favor for the identical reason. Yet, see how this obvious question makes fairly intelligent people say the most alarmingly stupid things.
said by Christopher Hitchens. Up to this point, we've been discussing the consequences of a hijacked fear system for all of us as individuals, across our day-to-day experiences and in our relationships. I hope it has become abundantly clear that our unchecked fear has consistently negative consequences that lie on a spectrum from mildly problematic to emotionally or relationally destructive. Now, I think it would be useful to expand our understanding of how our fear affects not just our individual lives and circumstances, but also how our hijacked fear permeates up throughout different levels of broader and broader social dynamics. The next level up from individual and interpersonal relating is cultural and subcultural relating. I'm using the word culture to describe any grouping of individuals based upon shared beliefs or characteristics, and not necessarily the more anthropological or social psychological term discussing nationality or ethnicity. There are three main consequences to our cultural dynamics that result from unchecked fear on an individual level. Rigid tribalism, increased social conflict, and violence. Rigid tribalism. Within the field of evolutionary psychology and anthropology and biology and others, you know, there have been 100 years of discussion about the development, utility, and maintenance of a concept called tribalism among various species, especially mammals. Tribalism can be defined literally as tribal consciousness and loyalty, or as the statement or fact of being organized in a tribe or tribes. Tribalism can more broadly be defined as strong in-group loyalty. Most animals, especially mammals, operate in a tribalistic manner. Tribalism generally serves the purpose of keeping us safe from outsiders, developing a sense of interpersonal identity, and having a familiar group with which to not feel lonely. We're not biologically designed to function asocially. The concept of tribalism is very important for our discussion of how fear affects cultural systems. If you were to take a step back from your everyday life, you would find that you are a member of several tribes based upon concepts like biological family, fictive kin, race and ethnicity, region of origin like country or state, educational status, employment, religious affiliation, gender identity, or sexual identity, just to name a few. For the most part, we self-identify based upon these concepts with some out of our control, like where we were born or skin pigmentation and others that are more in our control, like political affiliation. What's important to note here is that people choose to self-identify based upon these concepts. This process of self-identification underlies the first cultural consequence born out of our fear problem, rigid tribalism. When it comes to this concept of rigid tribalism, I think we need to have an intellectually honest discussion about the difference between typical, non-problematic, tribalism versus rigid tribalism, which is consistently problematic nowadays. It makes the most sense to take this concept of tribalism and place it on a theoretical spectrum, which could look something like, you know, imagine an arrow, a two-sided arrow in your mind. On one end of it is asocial individualism. On the other end of the arrow is rigid tribalism, and in the middle is adaptive group identification. This spectrum is a simplified way of viewing how people tend to identify as group members. On one end of the spectrum is a social individualism. This is the idea that a person almost pathologically avoids identification with groups, tribes, cultures, and kin. We might think of someone on this end of the spectrum as a kind of nihilistic psychopath, only looking out for number one and not caring about any group identity. In social psychology, this would be an extreme version of individualism. Whereas rigid tribalism would be an extreme version on the other end of the spectrum, which is in my mind a maladaptive adherence to a tribal identity or to multiple identities, to the point that you lose focus on your individualistic needs and your ability to think freely. Rigid tribalism typically results in strong negative consequences, especially because people are afraid of losing people from their tribe. So they engage in bullying or other coercive behaviors. Think back to the chapter on the four drivers of hijacked fear, specifically when I discuss technology and bullying. Tribalism creates outgroups. 
Whenever there's an outgroup, we automatically associate anyone who identifies with the outgroup as a representative of all the negative stereotypes, behaviors, and attitudes associated with that group. This is likely due to phenomenon studied in social psychology like the availability heuristic, and confirmation bias, and distinction bias, and the framing effect. Therefore, it seems as if we need a middle ground of some sort, which I've labeled on the diagram adaptive group identification. This idea of adaptive group identification I will discuss more in the chapter on solutions. But for the time being, I'd like to introduce my rationale. There needs to be some balance in identifying with a group in a meaningful way that helps us feel a sense of belonging and safety, but without losing our ability to think independently and develop a critical opinion about the groups with which we identify. This middle ground perspective, focusing on adaptive group identification and selection, is a source of contention in the field of biology and evolutionary science because there are contrasting views about the adaptive utility of self-selecting in groups. Innately, as individuals, we are selfish in a non-narcissistic sense, so that we and our genes survive better. And we will identify with and participate in groups to serve our attachment and physical survival needs in a patterned way. The problem, however, is that our group selection and participation also requires a somewhat consistent pattern of self-sacrifice to some degree. Because of other social and genetic differences, we all do not operate in the same way within a group that we identify with. So it's kind of questionable, given our diversity, even within a group with which we identify, that we truly self-select in an adaptive manner because group participation often results in negative consequences too due to conflict. So where does rigid tribalism come from? Well. It's an overreaction to conflict and fear. It's a fair statement to say that we all have been functioning in a tribal manner since the dawn of time. As we have made advances in economics, science, medicine, social politics, and, and various other categories of knowledge, our tribes have been presented with opportunities to challenge this basic framework and function differently as tribes. If a tribe i.e. culture, ideological group, religion, race, etc., is faced with consistent conflict or threats, the tribe has two choices. Modify its function and structure to adapt to the changes or remain rigid to promote a false sense of homeostasis. It's this idea of maintaining irrational homeostasis, to borrow a biology term, or more simply status quo, that promotes rigid tribalism. Therefore, there is a driving force underneath this desire to maintain the status quo. But what? I propose that fear compels us to become rigid when we operate in groups, as with the social psychology principles of groupthink and confirmation bias. These two biases, and many others, affect the way we perceive information from the world and make decisions about how it fits with what builds group cohesion or feels safe in our tribe. When we identify with a group, whether it be race, religion, nation, employment type, educational background, or what have you, we begin to feel as if the group represents who we are, or it becomes part of our identity. When people or incidents challenge a group with which we identify, our evolutionarily appropriate response is fear, because the fear will push us to react in such a way that will help our group or tribe survive. Because the world is changing much faster, advancing and producing new knowledge, connecting in such a rapid pace, we are more often faced with contradictory or challenging information about tribes with which we identify. Therefore, we are choosing to become more rigid in our tribal identification to maintain a sense of certainty and validity. It seems as if our ability to normally function in quasi-cohesive tribes for the adaptive purpose of survival and success has turned into, or is increasingly becoming, a rigid identity process among many cultures or tribes within the global population. It's palpable. The amount of fear that seems to just seep out of topics discussed on the news, in online communities, or on social media sites like Brexit, nationalism versus globalism, or the Machiavellian nature of various political leaders all over the world, terrorist groups, debates about 
religion being bad or good. It, it, it just appears that the normal healthy competition between tribes that leads to expectable conflict, which is manageable, is growing ever more intense with ever more disconnection between disparate ideology holders or tribes. So that now we have more social group conflict. Social conflict. If we build upon the individual consequences discussed in the last chapter, it makes even more sense that we seem to be experiencing so much more conflict, both between and within groups or cultures. The lack of intellectual honesty, combined with increased interpersonal conflict, will logically lead to increased social or group conflict. If we take a step back and survey the last five years of military events, political events, and, and social justice events, it seems as if we are experiencing an upswing in a more conflict-driven discourse about intergroup problems. This theory is somewhat supported by the data in uh, all but 10 nations in the world that are entangled in some sort of diplomatic or military conflict. According to one study of global conflicts since the Cold War, the general number of conflicts is steadily on the rise since 2010. Though fewer people are dying in these conflicts compared to the pre-Cold War era. From a non-military perspective, according to a Pew poll, people in the U.S. find that the greatest source of conflict is politics at this point, with other typical conflicts still viewed as a huge problem, including racial issues, age, and economics. To further prove that the cultures are in conflict increasingly more often, let's look at how news media is documenting this phenomenon. Many, many articles in the last few years have headlines mentioning culture wars and similar titles about categories such as music, politics, art, religion, and war. These mostly focus on blame and name-calling and subsequently offer few, if any, substantive solutions. Culture war is a nicely evocative title that simply fuels people's tribalistic fear, continuing to create outgroups and drive us apart. This culture war ideology in the media has escalated to the point where culture war is now a search category in major newspapers like the Huffington Post. One columnist even detailed the modern history of culture wars showcasing how we have been discussing cultural differences and fighting with each other since the 60s. However, while things have progressed in some ways, we are still fighting over the same basic cultural ideologies in an unending and self-defeating manner. But why is this going to be unending? Because we're not attacking the root of the problem, which is unmanaged fear and a lack of critical thinking. For the past 50 years, different cultural groups in society have been fighting for freedom, equal treatment, autonomy, and respect with some success. However, the wounds of the past and the psychological damage of tribalistic fear from the past are not gone, but rather getting worse. One group is reacting to past injustices and current injustices from another group and on and on to the point where everyone feels afraid that they will either continue to be a victim or become an oppressor. Taking this evidence into account, it seems like the next most logical consequence of rigid tribalism and an increase in conflict is an increase in the number of violent acts. Violence. The first, most obvious example of an increase in culturally-based violence is the increase in the number of terror attacks. Again, the premise in the chapter on f the four phenomenon like technology, greed, religion, push our fear process into overdrive and create easier opportunities for fear-driven consequences. Well, when we think of the modern-day terrorism of the Middle East, we're typically discussing either politically motivated aggression or religiously motivated attacks by groups like ISIS. Given that premise, I want to discuss the raw data about the prevalence of terrorist attacks, pre-technology and post-technology. The number of terror attacks has rapidly increased since the advent of the internet and our huge advances in travel, commerce, and weapons development. Combine this with tribalism via social media, and now we have a much larger number of terrorist attacks. So here's the data. There were 635 attacks in 1970, 460 attacks in 1971, 
and 486 attacks in 1972, which represented a steady trend up through the 80s and 90s. Now, fast forward to the era of 9-11, in which we were just developing and refining our abilities to utilize technology like the internet, and there were 1883 terrorist attacks, 1,883 attacks, over double. In the last few years, since the advent of the biggest social media platforms, advances in online banking and weapons development, the numbers have increased dramatically to where there were 4,784 terrorist attacks in 2010, 5,009 in 2011, 8,498 in 2012, 11,990 in 2013, 16,840 attacks in 2014, and 14,806 attacks in 2015. Take a step back and think about the dramatic difference from 1970 to 2014. The number of attacks increased from a few hundred to over 10,000 consistently. Hopefully this trend decreases. A second way in which this fear hijacking process is affecting cultures and promoting violence involves the topic of culturally motivated violence, like racially focused violence or other hate crimes. While the trends across various groups are inconsistent in their changes, the general rule of thumb for these various hate crimes is that more people are expressing their fear through violence as compared to the pre-internet era. For instance, in England, there were close to 45,000 hate crimes on record from 2013 to 2014, with the majority focused on race. Moreover, the number of hate groups is around 800 in the U.S. However, it hit its peak in 2011 at around 1,100. So the number is falling, but the number of hate groups is generally and steadily climbing up compared to the pre-internet era. This last source showed an interesting trend where in the U.S. we have seen an increase in the number of religious hate crimes and a decrease in racial hate crime. According to the FBI statistics, most hate crimes by percentage are of a racial and ethnic nature with around 6,000 incidents per year. In the U.S., the statistics indicate that approximately 7,000 people plus per year are killed or injured because of hate, which I would argue is simply tribalism leading to violence. One important caveat is that we have not been tracking hate crimes for a very long time in Western cultures. Furthermore, every source I read through in developing this section stated something along the lines of hate crimes are dramatically underreported. Therefore, it's possible this is a bigger issue than even the few reputable facts I listed here conclude. Summary. This very brief overview of the cultural consequences of unchecked fear highlights the trend towards more alienation based upon our differences and more violence, driven by our tribalistic instincts, which seem to be slowly spiraling out of control. Again, some of the trends about hate crime and violence appear to be decreasing, which seems promising. The scary thing is that the general trend for the phenomena highlighted above essentially shows a slow and steady increase since the mid-90s. Just as a quick recap, the order of operations goes like this. The individual fear consequences lead to more fear in our groups which leads to rigid group identification, i.e. tribalism, which leads to more intergroup conflict and violence. From sectarian violence in the Middle East to a blossoming of terrorist attacks around the globe in 2016 and 2017, we are so afraid of each other that we've allowed our more repugnant and primal group behaviors to overtake our desire to connect. To be perfectly clear, I am in no way advocating for an abandonment of culture or group identity. I simply want to highlight how our fear is driving us to over-identify with and make bad decisions based upon what our tribe says we should do. So what does this mean on a global scale? Well, as Lao Tzu said, violence, even when well-intentioned, always rebounds on itself. Chapter 7. The Consequences of Fear for Global Society Violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. 
Isaac Asimov. The consequences discussed so far are born out of hijacked fear, which blossom forth from the previous levels of analysis. Unfortunately, it seems as if consequences at one level of analysis reciprocally reinforce and even exacerbate the consequences discussed at different levels of analysis. Now that I've touched on the predominant consequences to us as individuals and groups, I think the last step is to discuss how our fear problem affects global society. As I have discussed many times throughout this work, the fact of the matter is, now that we're all more connected thanks to technology, travel, and advances in economic development, we are all stuck interacting with each other in some way, shape, or form. The new social expectation, thanks to social media, and how people have chosen to participate on social media, is to interact with people whom 40 years ago we never would have even thought about reaching out to or getting to know in any meaningful way. Global relationships are now more important and more normal, statistically speaking, than in prior generations. It seems as if various global, cultural, and technological shifts in the last hundred years are all pushing societies to function in a more global manner, which means more chances to interact with people different from ourselves, more chances to participate in fear-inducing dynamics, and become emotionally and cognitively hijacked by social norms. Whether you believe that we are all a part of a global society is not important for the purposes of this discussion. I am not a scholar on international trade or political science, so I'm not intending to step outside my scope and advocate for ideas that have basically no relevance to me and I have no basis for supporting given my studies or training. This is not a discussion on the pros and cons of nationalism versus globalism. I could not care less if you prefer a nationalist approach over a globalist approach to international affairs. To my knowledge, those concepts are not grounded in any kind of scientific or theoretical academic work about how to handle geopolitical differences and challenges based upon what we know about human behavior. It would take hundreds of pages to adequately discuss the various ins and outs of geopolitical struggle and make a more definitive statement about how to a better approach any given topic based upon the research and disciplines like psychology and anthropology or even evolutionary biology. But again, I don't care. That topic isn't germane to our fear discussion. What does matter are the consequences of our fear-based dynamics arising out of geopolitical issues, religion, economics, and war. I believe there are two consequences arising from our fear problem at the individual and cultural level that are now manifesting at the global level global distrust, and more rapid global dynamic change. Loss of trust. The first and deceptively simple consequence of hijacked fear from our individual lives pervading our cultural dynamics is a decrease in our ability to trust our own nations and other nations. Trust is the foundation of most facets of our lives at the individual, cultural, and global levels. Even the Secretary General of the UN agrees that we have a global trust problem that's keeping us from solving our problems, which has been echoed by others at the World Economic Forum. This mistrust phenomenon, disseminating from global politics and global economic issues, has become such a well-known problem that has become a focus of news headlines. A global survey completed last year showed that 57% of people distrust foreign governments and 51% distrust their own government. To be fair, this is only one survey from one group. However, a Pew Research poll from 2015 showed that citizens trusted the U.S. government to be at a historic low since 1958, which is somewhat reinforced by similar Gallup poll numbers. I wonder if these trends would be similar across other industrialized nations. My guess is yes, of course. To be clear, I am not regarding any of these statistics or articles cited above to reflect my personal views or the perfect picture of the world as it is. I only wish to present a snapshot from a few sources of just how prevalent the distrust phenomena is in our 
Zeitgeist. Thinking back to the four drivers of our fear hijacking problem from chapter four, there are multiple global challenges resulting out of our fear mediated by those four drivers that have occurred leading to less trust in our nations and in our allies and enemies. For example, because of incredible changes in technology, we can rapidly communicate, engage in military action, and research each other or spy on each other with extreme ease. Now, spying on our neighbors has been an, a big deal since the times of Sun Tzu and Julius Caesar, but the pace and scope of spying has rapidly grown in the last 50 years. There are something like 1,300 satellites in Earth's orbit that we know of. In the U.S. alone, there are 1,200 plus government groups and almost 2,000 private businesses working on intelligence and security issues. Taking just these two facts, think about how much access we have for keeping tabs on each other at home and abroad. An article from a few years ago found that the NSA alone was responsible for over 2,000 erroneous spying incidents in 2012. If there are thousands of erroneous spying incidents in one year, it's safe to extrapolate and assume that there are at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of sanctioned spying incidents in a year. Combine these numbers with the leaked information provided by Edward Snowden in 2013, and it's a fair bet to say that other world powers are built and operate in a similar fashion. For some reason, industrialized nations feel a strong need to invest excessive amounts of time, money, and other resources into intelligence gathering well, there are many variables that go into our desire to keep tabs on each other, but the simple explanation is we are highly suspect of each other, i.e. fear. A second example of fear about espionage relates to back in the 2016 presidential election. On both sides of the major campaigns during the election, and for almost the entirety of the first six months of 2017, there have been so many rumors, stories, and leaks related to espionage efforts within the U.S. and from other major world powers relating to candidate Hillary Clinton and President Donald Trump. The international community is in such a state of distrust that it has now seeped into presidential elections around the world. Now, to be fair, major world powers have been engaging in spying and espionage efforts since at least the early 1900s, and I'm certain historical versions of our modern world powers engaged in spying behaviors as well. Our distrust, i.e. fear, of our neighbors and of our own citizens has been able to flourish thanks to technological explosion that's occurred mostly within the last 100 years. As noted earlier, trust is a fundamental aspect of human behavior across most domains of our life. I believe it is important that we engage in a reality check about just how mistrusting the global scene has become. Mistrust not only leads to expenditures of energy and finances, but also to serious conflicts. Global Dynamics on Hyperdrive The second consequence, I believe, that has arisen out of our inability to have a healthy relationship with our fear process is a dramatic increase in the pace of international global dynamics. I believe the rapid pace of global relationships in economic and military dynamics results in only more stress or more fear for all parties involved. It's a safe assumption that we feel the need to relate to each other in a much more impulsive manner thanks to the last 40 years of advances in communication technology, military technology, and increased commerce between various nations. Of course, it is only fair to say that none of these advances and changes represent an inherently or completely harmful process. I do, however, wish to argue that the quicker we act and react with each other on the international stage, the more likely it is that bad decisions are going to be made, and more unnecessary civil, emotional, existential distance will be created between nations or other global economic actors. One simple example is the oil trade. 
Economists have been predicting that the increase in population, changes in technology, and changes in global economics will slow oil consumption down due to reported availability of crude oil. The most recent analysis shows that the upswing in demand for oil has shifted consumer and national behavior towards an even more rapid consumption and growth pace, which is similar for other facets of global trade as more countries enter the trading arena, which might even be affecting the environment and how animal species function. Technological development and implementation is now even moving and growing faster than the legal system can keep up with in countries like the U.S. All of this rapid growth leads to more fear about things like availability of resources, stability of companies, and stability of national relationships or corporate relationships. This results in more conflict in negotiating international politics and legal policies as well. Here's another simple example. This might illuminate my point somewhat more, and maybe more completely and concretely. Let's try another thought experiment about just how fast life moves nowadays, thanks to communication technology. Imagine, if you will, life roughly 80 years ago, right around 1937 or so. Jonas Salk had not yet created the polio vaccine, and many were still suffering and dying from many preventable diseases. World War II had not yet began. The Hindenburg disaster just occurred, and it was the Great Depression era. In that time, we had no internet. We had no advanced communication technology, apart from the telegram, which was popular but sparsely available. Shipping of mail messages about any local or international affairs mentioned above would take many days because the mail was delivered via train, and something like only 40% of households had telephones at the time. This likely meant that if someone wanted to communicate with you, we would have to wait a significant amount of time to hear or read the message being sent. Can you imagine waiting three to five days to get a message from a loved one or a coworker in a different city? Or for mail being shipped overseas about how finance and wars are progressing in other parts of the world? This meant that businesses moved slower, relationships formed more slowly, and people had to be patient in trying to understand what was happening in the world. This likely meant that growth in the global trade, more time was needed for countries to get involved in global military conflict. Or that simple communication about international politics occurred over the course of many hours or even days. Fast forward to 2017. The great majority of people have phones in their homes and their offices, if not cell phones, as well as email messaging. These forms of communication are instantaneous. We hear of an outbreak of a new form of the flu virus or of a global conflict, and we can all know within a matter of mere minutes, if not seconds, that something has happened. Given that we have the capacity to learn about events and communicate with each other so much more rapidly, it stands to reason that our global leaders now are making decisions about important issues much more quickly than in the past. As discussed earlier, this likely has a significant impact on global politics, economics, military conflict, and other important aspects of global interaction. Given the advancements in military, nautical, and aeronautics technologies, we can strike back or preemptively act in military conflicts in a few hours compared to the old technology of the 30s. Common fighter jets of the 1930s, like the Bristol Blenheim, Royal Air Force fighter, for example, flew at speeds of about 200 to 300 miles per hour, whereas the fastest jets of the modern day, like the SR-71 Blackbird or the Russian MiG, fly at over 2,200 miles per hour. If we take a serious look at just how dramatically technology has changed, and how much more capably and rapidly we can move and communicate, then our world influencers must be making global decisions based on an understanding that we can impact others very easily and very quickly. I hypothesize that our almost instantaneous ability to affect each other across the world must have some sort of impact on how afraid we are of each other on the global stage. 
This leads me to my final point of this chapter and of this entire treatise on how our unchecked fear problem is working and growing towards a dangerous way of being for everyone on the planet. A final concern. Combine the rapid global dynamic change with the distrust discussed above, and I think we have a very concerning state of global affairs that deserves some discussion. When I started this book, my goal was to help people understand just how unaware they are of their fear process and how it impacts their life in a very concrete and immediate manner. Since diving into the research process and refining my theories with colleagues, I found that our unchecked fear issues are not just a problem for us. The reality is, because of the incredible advances in economics and technology, our current global conflicts about trade, religion, and politics can now be a great impediment to human progress. These advancements could also result in life-ending wars using nuclear technology and bioweapons, which have become remarkably well understood and simpler to engineer. The importance of cultures and nations adequately understanding the complexities of international affairs cannot be understated. Simply because the less informed we are, the more we engage in groupthink and develop a fear-based perspective about others discussed in the prior chapters. The sad reality is, the U.S. and most other countries is struggling to develop trust with each other because of corruption and ideological disparity. I believe we all have arrived at a time in history with sufficient access to knowledge and capability to steer the ship out of harm's way. But we are choosing not to do so in any, let's say, consistent or appropriate manner. To drive this point home and wrapped up this uh, multi-chapter exploration of our individual cultural global fear problem, let's just do some math together to prove how threatening our circumstances really are. Again, please keep in mind that I'm speaking from the perspective of someone living in the U.S. Moreover, this is a thought experiment about which I cannot say definitively that a person will always be afraid of the things that I will list off below. On an individual level, there are a number of some daily experiences that will typically cause us to have fear. Being hit while driving, being on time to appointments, finding a job, maintaining your job, deciding about school or education, checking social media, watching the news, discussing politics, finding food, maintaining relationships, raising families, managing finances, paying off debts, government corruption. Is your doctor trustworthy? COVID. Advancing in society and figuring out the meaning of life. At the cultural level, people often struggle with or feel afraid of people of a different race or ethnicity or gender or sexuality or religion or political ideology or education level or type of profession or just level of social standing on any given day. At the global level, again, speaking from the perspective of someone living in the U.S., it's common to continue to feel fear about the status of the wars in the Middle East, possible and likely spread of religious extremism, Russia, China, North Korea, global trade and economic issues, environmental disaster, and global warming. This list could also contain many more fear experiences of varying degrees of intensity depending upon your specific life circumstances. To be fair, not every person has their life set up in a stereotypically Western fashion. Adding these ideas and situations up, there are at least, you know, for example, 33 situations you could feel fear about every day. Let's focus on just one of the examples above and estimate the number of times we have a fear response when engaged with something like, say, watching the news about politics. Given the repetitive and sensationalist nature of the news in the United States, it would be fair to estimate that the average person will have a fear response at least half a dozen times in just one hour when listening to news about politics. It's a fair estimation, I assert, that we have hundreds of fear reactions occurring in our brains in a given day while relating to people, working, consuming news or social media, and going about our lives in a typical Western world. 
With all these daily experiences of fear, it's no small wonder that we argue so often and we have such conflict the world over. This makes me fear that things are insidiously getting out of control. And I believe I've made a clear case to support my assertion. Now, now that there is a clear understanding of the state of fear in the world, I want to spend a moment with you discussing what I believe our future could look like. Obviously, there are billions of variables to consider when pondering the world and predicting the future. It is difficult to speculate about the specific future occurrences of our life in any meaningful way, which is obviously outside the scope of my practice and the scope of this book anyways. Given all that has been discussed up to this point, I think I can reasonably assume that we are heading in one of two general directions on this planet that will vary to some degree or another. First, it is altogether likely that we will continue fighting more and engage more often in wars and become more politically partisan, engage more religiously in a divided way and be more hostile about our beliefs, more rigidly tribalistic and nationalistic, and we could even end up engaging in nuclear war with each other. This scenario is obviously very scary because, unlike 60 years ago, many more nations and dictators have access to nuclear weapons or the means to create nasty bioweapons. Despite the UN and other international agencies attempting to step in to regulate or prevent others from creating such weapons, so many aspects of the market for dangerous technology and weapons are unregulated or even simply hidden. Although we do not commonly discuss this, anyone using the dark web and teaming up with rogue scientists adhering to dangerous political and or religious ideologies could relatively easily create a nuclear weapon or bioweapon and inflict massive amounts of damage on unsuspecting victims. Let us all hope that this is not the case, but it's not difficult to imagine our fear problem continuing to spiral out of control to the point where this happens. The second possible alternative is more hopeful, though I'm skeptical that this will happen because we are not addressing the underlying fear problem in any meaningful or impactful way. With all of us becoming a little bit more rational and developing a little bit more mindful relationship with our fear instincts. World leaders, individuals, cultures, religious groups, economic powers, and the like all start to wonder, how do we keep this game going long term? Slowly and steadily, people discuss the root problem in a more concrete way. We avoid the red herrings of politics, tribalism, religion, and economics as their rationalizations for living in a fear-driven mindset. Individuals, cultures, and nations begin developing more adaptive solutions to conflicts guided by a balance of intellectually honest reasoning and a healthy adherence to self-preservation born out of our gut feelings. Please bear in mind that I'm not advocating for a kumbaya way of living because, as I stated in prior chapters, that is also not quite how we are designed. Humans are much more complicated and part of our Living in a complicated life is normal and expectable conflict. This alternative is about how we choose to deal with our acute conflicts, our urges, and our existential struggles. Alternative number two could be one of the most ideal and optimistic outcomes for our fear problem, though unlikely. As promised at the beginning of this chapter, I will devote the final chapter to a discussion of the tools, tips, tricks, and ideas, and shifts that might help manage this fear problem in a more adaptive way that could lead to alternative number two. Before I end this section, I simply want to impress upon you again how concerning our state of affairs is shaping up to be based upon the logic used in the previous chapters. It is easy to write off parts of my argument in both reasonable and unreasonable ways. For example, Given how quote-unquote good life is in Western or industrialized nations, it is difficult to fully own the idea that something as small as a biased perspective due to religion, culture, education, politics, or other socializing phenomena can be problematic enough to result in potential nuclear war. Given the problems of lacking intellectual honesty and faulty coping, 
the fear associated with our small unchecked biases and other unreasonable fears experienced at the individual level begin to congeal and create cultural mindsets of fear-based tribalism, which then leads to international issues. Human beings and human cultures are complex systems. And I find it difficult to believe that a problem or error at one level of functioning does not affect other aspects of the system. So please, despite how incredulous some of my ideas or assertions may seem, please listen on to the last chapter and see if any of the reasoning or tips, tricks, and tools could be helpful. Chapter 8. Solutions for Attenuating the Fear Problem Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything, said by George Bernard Shaw. A call for change. Well, here we are at the end of this fear problem journey. I want to start off by saying that although some of the facts, assertions, and arguments are admittedly discussed in an alarmist tone, the goal is not to incite more unnecessary fear or cause a state of panic for those of you listening. My hope has been to illuminate the ideas and argue in a manner that is evocative enough to push us to change. I say us because I am no different, no better, no worse. I fall into the same fear traps and engage in the same problematic dynamics. Given the challenges discussed up to this point, it seems clear to me, at least, that much needs to be done to right the ship and counteract the fear problem adequately. The enormity, insidiousness, and complexity of the fear problem is why I believe we need to all take some responsibility for the state of affairs and put energy towards new or overlooked solutions. As for my part in helping combat the fear problem, I have some thoughts to share about how we can work on an individual, cultural, and global level to move towards a more balanced and mindful relationship with fear. Furthermore, while I do not believe it will magically disappear, we can start shifting towards a less fear-oriented way of living, more in line with how we're naturally designed to function. First, I believe an individual approach is necessary for avoiding the foreseeable negative consequences of the fear problem. In fact, I argue that the most fundamental means of improving the fear problem is at the individual level, because obviously, cultures and global societies are merely groups of individuals. As I referenced with the Shaw quote above, I think the main goal for the individual approach to remediating the fear problem is a shifting of mindsets, attitudes. I will offer well-reasoned and scientifically supported fear management practices to that end. Secondarily, I believe that there are some practicable strategies to implement at the cultural level that do not upend philosophies and customs or destroy what most cultures hold dear to make members of that said culture feel accepted. I do not believe we need to destroy any culture. Simply, we need to help cultures evolve through effort as members of our various cultural groups. And finally, I propose that the powers controlling or influencing decisions on a global level can engage in specific activities and mindset shifts to help improve our fear problem and even prevent more catastrophic consequences from occurring. Just as the consequences of the fear problem all build upon each other, I believe that these strategies for remediating the fear problem can also come together in a positive direction. Again, I have no misgivings about how illogical it is to strive for a one-world society or an idyllically kumbaya sense of brotherhood. This will hopefully be, you know, a more rational discussion about how we can all, me included, manage the unending and seemingly intractable struggle of existence and relationships. Individual Strategies we need to have a personal investment in change and a willingness to live a healthier lifestyle to combat the fear problem at an individual level. 
I propose we all do our part individually, and if we're part of cultures, encourage a more mindful dialogue and a stance of activism. I discuss the two consequences to ourselves as individuals in Chapter 5, loss of intellectual honesty and maladaptive coping, and I believe we need to focus on reversing those consequences. In that spirit, I propose strategies that either promote more intellectual honesty or simply help us cope more adaptively, which is to have a more mindful and balanced relationship with our fear process. Specifically, I want to focus on how to incorporate what many authors and research describe as a lifestyle of wellness. I'm going to borrow my definition of wellness from Dan Siegel, a brilliant author in psychology and psychiatry. A lifestyle of wellness, according to Dr. Siegel and Dr. David Rock, is an integrated sense of well-being or fulfillment built on the pillars of healthy sleep, physical activity, play, focus or critical thinking, intimate connection, relaxation, and time in or self-attunement or meditation. In the resources, there is a link to their website if you want to look that up, which is listed in the ebook you could buy. Although all the wellness concepts discussed above can work in concert to help us address our individual fear hijacking process, I want to focus on time in so that we can focus not only on how to cope better, but also relate and think in a more intellectually honest way. Please look up the other concepts and check out the resources at the end of this book to see how you can create a healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle of wellness by getting better sleep, eating better, being active appropriately, keeping your mind engaged, and staying socially connected. The wellness concept from Dr. Siegel supports a integrated neuroscientific understanding of the human mind relationship health dynamic. To have a healthier sense of time in, I want to propose three specific strategies. Mindfulness meditation, a self-checkup, and a strategic, let's say, conflict resolution technique to de-escalate interpersonal conflicts, which I describe with the acronym PASTA. Mindfulness. Perhaps the most underutilized tool for managing our emotional states outside of exercise is mindfulness. This practice, which is thousands of years old, has had some popularity in the last 20 years. Although mindfulness is typically associated with Eastern cultures and religions, I want to discuss it from the brain-body perspective. From the last 40 years of research within the fields of medicine and psychology, it is reasonable to assert that maybe a little bit of quiet time focused on our breathing can be of great benefit to stopping the fear hijacking process at the individual level. Mindfulness meditation promotes attentional focus and lessening of anxiety-induced distraction. Moreover, mindfulness meditation is commonly accepted as a method for managing anxiety across a variety of situations. Research over the past 20 years has shown that mindfulness-based practices are effective for managing fear and anxiety because meditations of this nature increase activation of frontal and relational brain areas responsible for affect re regulation, as I discussed in Chapter 3. Essentially, using mindfulness practices allows us to have less anxiety, a greater ability to focus, and a greater likelihood of responding with fewer judgments and less intense judgments. Side note, this is called metacognition, which is abundantly uh, clear in the research as a very effective skill for decreasing affect dysregulation. I believe we need to engage in a more mindful approach towards ourselves and those around us because our hijacked brain fear problem is not simply a problem for us. A growing trend in trauma and anxiety research is focused on intergenerational transmission and things like epigenetics, which are obviously often misunderstood and oversimplified, but the gist is the way that we function in this generation does affect the next generation. The standing theory in the field of epigenetics and mental health nowadays is that some of our genetic profile for being sensitive to traumatic experiences or being overwhelmed and hijacked is passed down genetically for future generations. Moreover, we see that maladaptive coping, like obsessive compulsive phenomena, addiction, and so on and so forth, um, also has some kind of genetic and epigenetic component. So it would be good if maybe we pass down less of a sensitivity to these tendencies. As a caveat, some of these genetic predisposition studies have come under quite 
let's say, reasonable scrutiny. However, the general conversation in the field is pointing towards support for attempting to understand how our life experience shapes our brain, which shapes our genes, which can be passed on to the next generation. If other mental health conditions like bipolar disorder, psychosis, and major depression have some genetic component, it's not unreasonable to think our fear response can have a genetic basis. Look at the research on trait neuroticism. The goal here is to engage in relationships with ourselves and others in such a way that we can live more realistically trusting and with less fear of one another. Trust is very important because it allows us to work together adaptively. Also, it feels good, releasing endogenous oxytocin. The more mindful we are, the easier it is for us to form accurate or unbiased judgments about others and feel safer and more connected. Utilizing a mindfulness technique on a regular basis could help greatly in the fight against both intellectual dishonesty as well as maladaptive coping. If we can develop a regular mindfulness routine, our daily experiences of anxiety should decrease. This means we can theoretically think more clearly to promote more intellectually honest conversation and intellectually honest self-examination. Furthermore, if we feel more consistently calm and centered, for which mindfulness practice is designed, then we're less likely to want to check out using drugs, alcohol, social media, sex, excessive exercise, and the like. The goal here is not for radical change. I have no desire for everyone to become Buddhist monks or yogis. The goal here is just to encourage you to engage in a new exercise, promoting greater mind-body awareness, which calms you down, which allows you to think more clearly. Meditation is by no means a cure-all, simply a nice adjunctive tool to help pretty much all people, including myself, manage the all too frequent anxieties and fears we experience. The next tool, the self-check-in, will promote even greater capacity for intellectual honesty so that we can check our biases, judgments, and other facets of ignorance and hypocrisy that go on festering in our mind every day. Self-check-in. One of the issues I outline in the section on intellectual honesty in Chapter 5 is how people often automatically react or engage in biased thinking. To tackle our biases and our more automatic responding way of being, we need to, metaphorically, shove a stick in the spokes of our mental wheels to get back to a realistic and intellectually honest manner of thinking. We need to tip the bike over. To be frank... I think we all need to relearn how to operate more pragmatically. So I'm going to borrow from the comedian Craig Ferguson as a simple example of the process I believe is badly needed to rectify this intellectual honesty problem. In one of his stand-up shows, Mr. Ferguson talks about his history of failed marriages, alcoholism, and interpersonal conflict. Finally, he relays to the audience that he has begun asking himself three questions. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? And does this need to be said by me now? This is a classic 12-step truism for those of you interested. Although his stand-up routine is designed for getting a laugh from his audiences by telling hyperbolic stories, the gravitas in his three questions is quite apparent given the discussion of his prior relationships and the chaos of his life. The principle underlying Mr. Ferguson's three questions is how to self-monitor or check in with oneself before engaging in interpersonal stupidity. To successfully achieve this reality check like Mr. Ferguson's questions, I want to combine a few concepts into one to describe our self-check-in technique. We need a new habit. We need to return to our kernel of intellectual honesty, as Gwynin described it. So I'm going to propose a tripartite check-in process that literally anyone can simply but not easily implement into their routine. I want to differentiate simple from easy for you because I do not wish to mislead you about the challenge that lies ahead of you if you choose to follow through with this technique. What I'm about to recommend is clear. It makes sense and has very few moving parts and concepts, which makes it simple. The problem is that because of our already hijacked brains, we will have to use a great deal of mental effort and energy to fully undertake this new exercise. 
and essentially retrain our brains and fight our evolutionary programming. Again, this fear problem is the result of our healthy or evolutionarily adaptive fear response to perceived rejection or threats to safety. Having been wired to respond to ideas, concepts, and experiences that are neither eminently threatening nor important. As part of the rewiring process, hopefully in conjunction with some daily meditation, I think the first part of the tripartite model should be a tool for challenging our notions prior to any fear response. The simplest and most powerful tool for challenging our assumptions is a technique that is hundreds of years old and more recently incorporated into psychology and psychotherapy called Socratic questioning. Although it would be helpful to become acquainted with Socrates, his life, his rationale for developing a logic system, etc., I will leave that for you to explore on your own. In the resources section at the end of this book, which I hope you purchase, I have listed some good reads on Socrates and his logic system. Socratic questioning is a quick and dirty method for getting to the bottom line of an assumption, idea, or belief. Literally, the goal of this exercise is to help you challenge your own assumptions and suppositions using your knowledge of both common sense and consequences. There are many versions of Socratic questioning exercises, but they all boil down to a few basic types of questions. Clarification of ideas, foundation exploration, showing counter evidence, perspective change, and evidentiary expansion. To streamline this, to be a simple step in our model, I'm going to leave you with four questions you should ask yourself every time you find yourself thinking about any topic that has been, is, or could be a source of contention. Number one, how clear is my belief or perspective? Is it detailed and nuanced or is it vague and ambiguous? Number two, what facts, not life experiences, support my belief and perspective? Number three, have I considered all facts that both support and challenge my belief or perspective? And number four, have I fully considered my biases and their influence on my belief and perspective? These questions are, as I promise, very simple. I recommend performing this exercise often, if not daily, then at least on a weekly basis. This exercise is designed to be carried out in your free time, not during an argument. If your answer to any of the questions is, I'm not sure, then more thought and reflection is needed before you assert yourself. If your answer to the fourth question, have I considered my biases fully, is no, then I implore you to do yourself and others the kindness of questioning your biases. Our emotional history and life experiences greatly and importantly shape our biases, and many of the stupid and needless arguments that occur on the news, at the bar, at the dinner table, in Congress, and frankly anywhere, typically arise from unchecked bias, which leads to emotional hijack. Your life experiences are and were real. But they're not facts. They're not data points. They cannot serve as verifiable evidence of a phenomenon being good, bad, right, wrong, true, or not true. Life experiences hold no weight and should carry no weight when talking about concepts like how to manage taxes, politics, economics, medicine, biology, prejudice, discrimination, or anything else that's important. We need to be more mindful of the statistics that exist, the data that exists about any topic, and develop realistic predictions about the future. The rate of change, as it were, like in the example I used in the chapter on the rate of progress in LGBTQIA folks in the U.S. The second part of our tripartite model for restoring intellectual honesty is deceptively simple. Avoid asserting your opinion regarding topics about which you do not know the facts. To be clear, I'm not advocating for some kind of draconian free speech censorship or something like that. I'm simply going back to Craig Ferguson's three questions so that you don't have unnecessary drama. If we don't really know what we're talking about, and typically 
we get into arguments about topics we haven't really fully explored, then why set yourself up to waste time and argue? I fully support you asking questions in a non-accusatory tone, especially when they're about ideas or concepts about which you have an opinion. In fact, if you find yourself faced with someone espousing ideas with which you disagree, ask those four Socratic questions listed earlier in as non-threatening a manner. Even if that argument gets heated, you successfully challenge not only your own thought process, but another's point of view, which is a gigantic leap in the right direction. This is perhaps the most difficult component of the tripartite model because it seems as if we all, myself included, are almost habitually inclined to jump right into an argument nowadays. The level of discourse in many Western countries, with the U.S. being perhaps the saddest example, has fallen to the low of constant argument sans critical thought. We need to break this habit. And we need to break this habit quickly so that we can reacquire a sense of basic decency in our discourse. For example, how many of you in the U.S. and abroad have said ridiculous things in arguments and even broken ties with people over something related to politics or Donald Trump? I highly encourage you, stopping right now and just thinking to yourself, consider the wide array of topics that you have argued about in your life and how much you actually know about those topics. These are the topics to avoid until more critical thought and more effort has been put forth into a fuller understanding of them. This fruitless behavior needs to stop on all of our parts. The final part of our tripartite model for bolstering intellectual honesty is also deceptively simple. I encourage you to force yourself to spend 30 minutes per week listening to a contrasting viewpoint about any topic that you believe is important. This applies to fact-driven concepts like science, politics, economics, and health. I also highly encourage you some direct challenging of more philosophical and fluid topics like religion, values, and uh, sense of self. This may seem like it fits within the first segment of the tripartite model, but it's actually a separate activity that needs its own emphasis and its own goal so that you can rebuild intellectual honesty. The nice thing about engaging in a structured activity devoted to learning new perspectives is that we only gain by functioning this way. The worst thing that can happen by devoting time to new perspectives is you lose some time out of your day to someone preaching absolute nonsense. This can only help support a more intellectually honest point of view because now you've fully processed one counter-argument. What is most important in this exercise, again, like I referenced in the introduction in later chapters, is attempting to listen with an attitude of transformative learning. The more reasonably and more open-mindedly we are about listening to people when they speak, the more likely it is that we gain knowledge to bolster an argument or use ideas we disagree with to refine our own arguments. In review, the tripartite model for rebuilding a mindset of intellectual honesty is composed of the four Socratic questions, healthy avoidance of superficial and superficially understood topics, and about 30 minutes of challenging your views each week. I hope these tools are clear and my reasoning makes sense to you. The potential pros and cons of engaging in this tripartite exercise could include the following. One, less time wasted. Two, more peace of mind. Three, a more flexible mindset. Four, a greater fund of knowledge about important topics. Five, fewer reason to check out in relationships because you're forming better relationships. The potential negative consequences of engaging in this exercise are 30 minutes of time wasted per week, a period of intense cognitive dissonance, which is very uncomfortable, about your beliefs, wanting an apology from someone because of a disagreement, or feeling compelled to apologize to others whom we've maybe ostracized or argued with. To help with the relational aspect of promoting change at the individual level, I've created my final tool at which hopefully will serve as a starting point for repairing or improving the quality of our relationships as a means of living less afraid and feeling more emotionally safe. P-A-A-S-T or PASTA. My little acronym is a quick decision 
tree or de-escalation tactic for when we're starting to feel heated when we argue with each other and we're at that problematic level of discourse. Or maybe even just arguing and fighting in general. It stands for pause, acknowledge, apologize, separate, try again, and uh, there's another apologize at the end there, so pasta. Simple enough, right? The goal for this tool is very simple. We want to start breaking the chain of needless arguments in which we all engage on a rather frequent basis, especially here in the U.S. and on social media. You've likely heard of very similar conflict de-escalation techniques, and I hope that my variation is simple and effective. This is a tool I have used with clients and, and families and friends and strangers, and I've even used it in couples therapy, and uh, I've even tried it uh, in my personal life, and it seems to work fairly well. The first step is to pause. To pause appropriately, I recommend between 15 and 30 seconds of you not responding to the other person in the situation, which is starting to become heated. This might feel awkward and unfamiliar, and it should. The majority of us were never taught to cool off when we feel activated. Just sit with the awkwardness of the silence so that your brain, particularly your frontal cortex, can begin to do its job to help your midbrain calm down and start processing more logically. The second step is to acknowledge, specifically acknowledging that you feel hijacked or heated and that you do not wish for things to get worse. This is about you, not the other person. Research shows that by actively stating what we have experienced, as in verbalizing our feelings, we feel a slight sense of relief. Interestingly, some brain research shows that verbalizing our problems in a mindful manner helps decrease just general tension in the moment. Essentially, by using our critical thinking parts of the brain, responsible for language, awareness, analysis, frontal lobes, it decreases the activity of our more emotional parts of the midbrain. Moreover, due to feeling less tense by verbalizing our problems, we begin to kind of decrease the interpersonal tension and reinforce our healthy sense of self-agency and advocacy, our belief in our ability to effectively manage our life. Another way of looking at this acknowledgement idea is to think of it as a first attempt at asserting yourself in a healthy way. Indeed, assertiveness is a major positive force in the resolution of conflict if you find yourself separating for a longer period, it might be wise to engage in the Socratic question component of the prior self-check-in exercise. The third step is to separate. I recommend at least five minutes of space when we're getting heated or about to be heated. And longer if we're already mid-argument and losing it on each other. From a basic neuroscience perspective, when we get hijacked to whatever degree, our midbrain, our kind of, our emotional centers are kind of so overactivated that our frontal skills aren't as involved. Ergo, if you have successfully completed the acknowledgement step correctly, which is essentially um, using your frontal cortex to, you know, cool off, you now have a modicum of mastery over your immediate emotions. This process sets the stage, or primes the brain, for continued frontal cortex control over the emotional centers of your midbrain. Again, I'm not proposing we think our way out of our feelings and our problems, because that's literally impossible, despite what cognitive therapists may say. I am, however, proposing that we have a more neurologically integrated way of processing and coping with our feelings, a la Dan Siegel. The goal of an integrated mind, which supposedly is a key strategy for both living well and mental health. In this way, asking to separate is an active frontal cortex process that involves reasoning, planning, and memory. It increases our frontal cortex functioning and balances our emotional state while adding some mental free space to breathe. This space to breathe can further decrease the intensity of our emotional states in pretty much any setting and with most emotional struggles. Finally, after separating for a substantial period, the goal is to try the conversation again. If it appears like you or the other person in your midst is still hijacked, then it would be wise to cool down some more and go back to separating. If you both appear relatively calm, then it is worth trying to articulate your feelings 
and beliefs, again, in as non-aggressive and intellectually honest a manner as you can muster. If things were already in a heated argument prior to pausing, this might also be a good time to apologize. The goal of this step is to simply keep the conversation and relationship moving forward. Often in the process of arguing, we are so overwhelmed, we simply give up, become resentful, and more distant, which can lead to the unnecessary loss of the relationship. If we keep trying to have our voice heard in a reasonable manner, and we encourage others to do so when we're calmer after separating, then it's likely that we're going to feel safer and connected, which is advantageous for us and fits with our programming. That concludes the section on individual strategies for remediating our fear problem. There are dozens of other health and wellness practices I could recommend so that we have a more regulated mind and body. However, my goal was to be succinct and focus on the most concrete and impactful strategies that can help reverse our maladaptive coping and loss of intellectual honesty. As I see it, concepts like mindfulness, self-challenging and self-check-in, and conflict resolution are the most underutilized in Western culture and ironically are the most challenging to implement. Please feel free to incorporate as many other healthy, calming, compassionate, mindful, and understanding practices as you like into your fear management strategy. Additionally, I have not specifically yet addressed the four drivers of the fear problem I discussed back in Chapter 4. This section is not really devoted to addressing the social phenomenon. I would guess that a more mindful approach towards our use of social media and technology, religion, money, and all these things could help lessen the stress and fear of our daily lives. These topics will be discussed in greater detail in the next section, focused on cultural strategies for improving our fear problem. Cultural Strategies This section, addressing the cultural level of fear hijacking, might become challenging for you because I'm going to be proposing ideas and changes to how you function in your various tribes, which will inherently call into question some aspects of your self-identity. To be perfectly clear, I am in no way attempting to demean or defame with the statements and propositions forthcoming. My hope is to provide both very concrete challenges to the ideas underlying the three cultural level consequences, rigid tribalism, conflict, and violence. This section will be divided into two parts, addressing how to reverse rigid tribalism and how to level off the conflict and violence consequences addressed in Chapter 6. Theoretically, addressing the tribalism consequence will impact the level of conflict and violence, so I will not specifically be addressing how to engage in less violent behavior. As I discussed in Chapter 6 and 7, I believe that each level of consequences builds upon and exacerbates the prior levels. In the same way, I believe our work at the individual level of fear management can bolster our success towards functioning more effectively and adaptively at the cultural level and will in turn prevent foolish and unnecessary violent behavior, no matter what its motivations. As a final reminder, this is not an attempt at encouraging you to give up your earthly possessions, abandoning your phone, your computers, giving away your money, becoming anarchists, renouncing your religious life, and returning to a lifestyle reminiscent of the wandering mendicants of the Buddha's time or Plato's cave. I have done my best to avoid hyperbole and extremism and will be focusing on what hopefully is a reasonable approach towards understanding and living out our tribalistic instincts. Reversing Rigid Tribalism I want to attack the problem of rigid tribalism on two fronts. First, I want to pitch to you an ideological shift about how to identify with your tribe. Second, I want to encourage you to reflect on the degree of participation in your various tribes and the extent to which that could serve you in more or less adaptive ways. These are separate yet related goals and need to be dealt with as such, separately and purposefully because we all are functioning at various levels of commitment to our identities as members of tribes and living based upon the tribe's norms and values. For example, some of you may become more rigid about your religious beliefs and heavily involved in your religious practices. Others of you might see your religious identity more as a fraction of your identity and not its core, 
participating in rituals and services as you see fit without being overzealous or overinvolved. Finally, others of you, like the cafeteria Catholic, are far from involved or militarized and are not living based upon literal interpretations of your religious or holy books. Regarding the notion of shifting and re-examining the extent to which we identify with our tribe, I think the simplest place to begin is to decide how useful it is to strongly identify with any of your given tribes. In chapter 6, I introduce the concept of adaptive group identification, which implies that we function best when the degree of group identification provides for better functioning and better chance of genetic survival. The goal, as I see it, is to maintain a sense of identification with your tribes in a manner that keeps you feeling connected, but also disconnected enough for you to feel free to function as an individual and to pursue your life in a reasonable manner. My main problem, as discussed in chapter six, is that when we over-identify with our tribe, we start to lose our capacity to think critically and operate adaptively in our environment out of fear of rejection by our tribe. This is the problem with preposterous phenomenon observed in the U.S. nowadays, like identity politics and religiously inspired violence, as for the example of like ISIS and many other smaller examples. If one's tribe, whether it be our racial group, family clan, religious group, hobby, organization, career guild, or any other group to whom we belong and identify, if all of these identities hinder our free thinking and our exploration of life's mysteries and autonomy, then there is a problem. This might seem to you as somewhat perplexing. It might seem perplexing because, for instance, not every member or subgroup within a larger tribe can be radical or constricting in its ideology or expectations. In order to develop adaptive group identification, I think we need to have rational expectations about how we identify and how we understand ourselves as creatures walking across this planet. The best example in modern history is Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, containing the famous line, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. We still have not figured out that our identity is fluid and cling to facets of how we choose to identify, such as by our skin color, our 23rd chromosome, our sexual orientation, religious preferences, our country of origin, like an infant to a blanket. I challenge you to ask yourself a few very simple questions regarding any tribe that you currently participate in, either literally or metaphorically. First, ask yourself this, how important how crucial for my survival is it for me to identify this way? And depending upon how you answer that question will influence your answer to the second question, which is, does my identification as blank allow me to feel free to relate to others who are seen or seem differently? If you answered the second question and are struggling to feel free, then I suggest stepping back from this piece of your self-understanding and moving towards a more integrative way of seeing yourself. Perhaps lessening the extent to which this piece of your identity affects you and how you conduct yourself. We are not simple creatures. And living as if we are only men or only straight is a boring and empty life. Many facets of how we self-identify are not within our control. For instance, skin color or 23rd chromosome. And yet others are. To be fair, different people from different regions on this planet will struggle with the first question more because, for instance, in many cultures in the Middle East, if you are not identifying with the correct religious group, then your chances of dying are pretty great. And if you try to leave your family's religion, you can be killed. Here in the United States, we have a much freer society, so we have more choice. I propose that we take advantage of the freedoms that we have to function better. Regarding the degree of participation in your various tribes, I want to center this discussion on two things. How big are our tribes and how consistently we have interpersonal contract with others in our tribe. 
The first challenge is figuring out how many people we really need to survive and thrive. I think that given how much society has advanced and how much contact we have with others nowadays, we might need to rethink or even shrink our relationship circles. Obviously, having close relationships is highly beneficial to our health and welfare, but I think we're oversaturated. This leaves us with a problem of figuring out whom to keep in our lives and by what metrics we should use to evaluate the importance of keeping people in our lives and to what extent. The most scientific approach to this question that makes sense to me is based upon the work of Robin Dunbar. Dunbar conducted decades of anthropology and psychology research focusing on our brain complexity and norms across cultures and species, which has resulted in the so-called Dunbar's number which is an estimate of the maximum number of people and relationships we can reasonably manage, which is something like 150 people. To be fair, some have challenged Dunbar's number, whereas others have sought to expand upon or confirm the concept. Dunbar's original work hypothesized that because our brain's functional capacity is limited, humans can process information and manage feelings of about 150 or so people optimally which are divided into four types of relationship groups that can be envisioned as four concentric circles, like a bullseye, with the innermost layer or smallest circle being composed of five of our closest and most intimate relationships. The second largest circle is our 10 relatively close relationships, so like more distant family and friends and colleagues. The third largest circle contains about 35 people of mild to moderate intimacy and familiarity. These are your neighbors and other familiar conspecifics. And the final layer, or bullseye circle, is about 100 people from our past and present with whom we are familiar, but whose relationships do not require intense participation. This is the basic landscape of optimal relational functioning and capacity, and I think it can be nicely applied to our current circumstances to help ease rigid tribalism. I believe that many people in Western cultures, like the U.S., might participate in either too many tribes, which would automatically force us to keep in contact with well over 150 people, or that we participate with too many members of one or more tribes in our life in very intense ways, and perhaps both create problematic dynamics for you. The simple example is how we engage in social media. Of the roughly 1 billion people on Facebook, the average user has somewhere between 155 and 388 friends. Obviously, the extent to which these friends are more intense and connected with the user is up for debate and unknowable. Automatically, however, the average Facebook user is well over Dunbar's number. Now, imagine how many other people not associated with Facebook are involved in the average person's life. Maybe one or two dozen other people family or friends, right? In this way, we're overwhelming our capacity to process all the intricacies and anxieties of having relationships. I cannot imagine a way in which having more people in our life would result in less fear. Now, apply the same logic to those of you involved in a religious system. In addition to your family, co-workers, friends, lovers, and so on, that do not attend your church, roughly 46% of you will attend a church of more than 100 people, and 36, 100 to 100 to 499. Simply by practicing a religious belief system, we automatically are over Dunbar's number. You could take this logic system, which is the number of people in your tribal group and the number of people outside the tribal group equals more than 150, and apply it to many common groups in which we participate nowadays, political tribes, religious tribes, cultural tribes, hobbies, all these kinds of groups. If my basic logic is correct about Dunbar's number and how many people we interact with every day, week, month, and year, then I believe there are two simple, not easy solutions to our tribe participation problem that results in fear. First, maybe we should limit the number of people that we interact with on a regular basis. Do you honestly need to interact with hundreds or even thousands of people on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat? Imagine if you took all of the emotional and cognitive energy expended by participating in social media and invested it into your close relationships, in the here and now, the ones that really matter, in a manner more fitting with how we're designed, despite the fact that it's not very popular. 
Secondarily, I believe we need to limit the number of tribes in which we participate. It is common and more than understandable to want to feel included by various groups sharing similar ideologies or customs. For example, maybe your nuclear family is the most toxic tribe, and it would be wise to pull away from them. For others, you may belong to polarized or violent political ideological groups, and you definitely need to leave them. Regardless of whether the group is professional or personal, the groups in which you participate that are the most rigid, most polarizing, and most closed off to change or free thinking, these are the groups that are causing both the most social and personal harm, and they hamper your intellectual and emotional freedom, which all exacerbate the fear problem. Even if you leave a few ideological groups, you still have a voice. You still belong. And you still have numerous opportunities to interact with tons of tribes. And your close relationships will still help you feel seen. And you can still attempt to enact change and express your, your views. This may seem like an overly simplistic approach to combating rigid tribalism. But it stands to reason that we operate in very simple and patterned ways. What the cultural level of the fear problem comes down to is an inability to reform tribes to operate more logically or an inability to have intergroup harmony. One of the fundamental problems with tribalism is that it is so deeply programmed into our psyche and ingrained in the cultural and social mores of our, our way of being that we don't notice it. It works in the background as we wander about our day. So, step one is acknowledging that our tribe or ideological group is struggling with rigidity, closed-mindedness, and or violence. Step two is examining your allegiance to your tribe, and if that's really all that necessary to identify with said tribe to survive both literally and socially. Step three is to reflect on steps one and two and make a strategic decision about how often and how intensely you involve yourself with various groups, or simply leave the groups altogether. This will help us get in fewer fights over ideology and allow us to pare down our social groups somewhere closer to Dunbar's number. Global Strategies The final layer of the fear problem relates to geopolitical dynamics. The two consequences of the fear problem at the global level I discussed in the previous chapter were loss of trust and faster moving societies. And the focus here for me will be rebuilding trust. The best metaphor for global society is business in my opinion. So I'm going to pull from predominantly research related to fields of economics and industrial organizational psychology to describe some tips for our world leaders or for those of you reading who can in some way influence world leaders through political or personal means. Again, I'm not an international scholar of any kind. I'm not an expert on geopolitical affairs. So the tips below are simply what I perceive to be reasonable goals or aspirational principles. As always, I welcome criticism and debate. This will also be the shortest section because it's the furthest outside my wheelhouse and the least likely to change because of the billions of variables involved. I think it's going to be nearly impossible for global society to slow down to a more mindful pace because modern economic systems, technologies, and military actions are not designed to move slowly anymore. However, I would like to believe that we can maybe pull back the throttle just a little with some changes. The first tip is kind of a no-duh idea. To focus our policies and energies on building trust. Trust is essential to running businesses and playing well with allies, as well as competitors. The two qualities of leaders that seem to engender trust are reciprocity and responsiveness. So global leaders and other key players might reflect on to what extent they embody those two qualities. Moreover, it seems like a smaller number of alliances, like in the discussion about tribalism and Dunbar's number earlier, could help maintain trust and, let's say, tweak optimal international dynamics. With fewer allies, that would likely slow down geopolitical relations and make it, let's say, easier to form a deeper relationship with allied government officials, theoretically. Finally, people seem to have a problem with corrupt governments, so it stands to reason 
that we should do our best to support more transparent governments and do our best to discourage and distance ourselves from corrupt leaders. These are more reasonable strategies. But I can foresee impacting the global climate in a positive direction, hopefully with these and other reasonable strategies that will play a part in diminishing our fear problem. The Four Drivers To end this book, I want to keep good on my promise and talk about how to incorporate all the potential solutions from earlier in this chapter as a means of beginning to unravel the four drivers of the fear phenomenon discussed in chapter four. This will be brief because I believe these four phenomena are so enormous and so complex in scope that no simple solution could exist. Regarding technology, I think there are two attitudes that we can adopt to reclaim our peace of mind. Mindfulness and skepticism. As I alluded to in the chapter four, we have to become engrossed whenever we get on technology and social media, especially in countries like the U.S. to the point where people need detoxes from technology, from their smartphone or whatever it is. If we adopt a more mindful attitude about our technology, then maybe we can develop a slower approach to relaying and refocus on person-to-person -person connection in a more meaningful manner. Secondarily, I think we need to keep a skeptical eye on the potential perils of technological advancement and over-reliance on technology to make life easier or better. Recently, a great deal of discussion has occurred regarding topics like AI, CRISPR, and gene editing and related things. Countries like the U.S. have the luxury of transparency in news media and research journals, and the more informed we are as consumers about controversial and potentially life-threatening and life-changing technology, like AI and gene editing, the better chance we have for survival. Regarding politics, there is simply so much to say. I already offered some thoughts in the global solutions section above. However, I'll refer to the mindfulness and intellectual honesty and tribalism arguments above because I think they could serve best to reduce the problem of political insanity observed in the U.S. and abroad. The incessant arguing, mudslinging, and operating in an us-versus-them manner is creating insanity and fear like never before in the U.S. We need to breathe. We need to stop and think before we speak. We need to all challenge our perspectives politically. We need to let go of partisan thinking. We need to start judging ideas for their merit and stop agreeing or disagreeing with them based upon who says them, what color tie they wear, or because of their ideology. This tribalistic and automatic response we have against people who adhere to different beliefs and ideas is not going to end because that's just human nature. However, we can reel it back in a little by challenging how honest we are intellectually and when we debate, and by breathing before we act, we need to be informed consumers, not people reacting because of sound bites espoused by news anchors or politicians. The more mindful we are, the less rigid we are. The more mindful we are, the more critically we can think. Regarding religion, I challenge you to consider the extent to which your beliefs make sense and the extent to which they contribute to any rigidity and tribalism in your life. As I mentioned in chapter 4, this is not an atheist manifesto. For the atheist argument that picks apart religions and their flaws, please refer to the works of authors like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, Edward Wilson, Lawrence Krauss, and Peter Singer, to name just a few. I'm here to argue about the consequences of your beliefs and practices. To the extent that your beliefs and rituals can cause you to be rigid or disconnect from others, then I consider that problematic. If your belief in God or gods compels you to inhibit the freedom of others or cause harm, that's a problem to me. For example, a Buddhist may adhere to unscientific beliefs about karma and reincarnation. But the other tenets espoused in the Eightfold Path are rarely, if ever, going to compel a Buddhist monk to cause harm to other people. Try the two-step process for reversing rigid tribalism mentioned uh, earlier and give Socratic thinking a try. 
If we continue to operate with our heads in the sand because we're afraid of what will happen if we challenge religious beliefs, then the more extremists of any faith will develop. Regarding greed, I believe we must focus on combating fear at the individual and cultural level first. Some of the problems that cultivate greed can be affected by bigger forces like government and private economic institutions. And some of the problems must be addressed by individuals, like our fear of failure, fear of success, fear of shame, fear of being oppressed, drug problems, mental health issues, and, and, and anything else that exacerbates the fear problem that creates a desire for greed. First, we need to admit the truth of reality, the normal curve of life. Second, we need to breathe and make more rational decisions about personal and collective finances. There are many wealthy individuals who are causing minimal harm in this world and do not need to be demonized using tribalistic and intellectually dishonest rhetoric like one percenter. This accomplishes basically nothing and tends to create more harm and more divide. Moreover, some people are going to struggle more than others. Some people will financially struggle more than others because of a combination of both personal and socio-political reasons. And we need to accept that because equality does not exist anywhere in nature, it should not exist for us. That doesn't mean we can't work to be loving and compassionate and help people who are struggling. This notion of equality is an artificial and aspirational construct of human thought born out of existential fear, I assert. Once we accept this and breathe a little, then we can make more reasonable decisions for ourselves as individuals about being financially responsible, learning how to save, how to work hard, and how to sacrifice some of our wants and needs for the sake of the future. Many authors since the time of Epictetus spanning everything from philosophy to civil rights, from Kierkegaard to Martin Luther King Jr., tell us that we need to struggle as individuals and as cultures to achieve a better outcome for ourselves. In the U.S. specifically, there are many variables to our fear-driven greed and economic issues. Final thoughts. At the start of this book, I set out with the goals of showing you that our fear is getting out of control. Why that's so, some of the problems we face because of it, and some solutions to help reverse the fear problem. I hope that you feel as if I've accomplished these goals. Furthermore, I hope you understand how diligently I have worked to hedge when I'm uncertain, to support my ideas with credible sources, and to operate from a place of logic and not rhetoric. Some of my biases show here and there, and that's fine. Over the course of this past year or so, researching and writing this book, much of my life and in the U.S. has changed. And I think any shifts in my tone reflect those changes I experienced while writing, while staying true to principles like intellectual honesty and transparency. I wanted this to feel like a dialogue rather than a professor spouting statistics to you in a classroom. Most of all, I wanted this to make sense, because it probably feels like much of what's happening in the world today does not seem to make much sense at all. We are at a crossroads as individuals and cultures and as a global community. With how much we know about human functioning and well-being, we have a decision to make. In fact, I see that there are only two choices. Choice number one, we choose to continue operating on automatic pilot and living a fear-driven reactionary lifestyle, which means we have chosen, I believe, to keep suffering unnecessarily. Choice number two, we choose to work on the fear problem, living a more mindful life, reason more honestly, and live as we were designed to live, which means society has a chance of not eventually destroying itself. Our personal success and well-being is at stake, as is the welfare of those we love, and those with whom we live and work. How will you choose 